that Claudette Colvin's lawsuit was the one that went to the Supreme Court that changed the law. Claudette Colvin's actions accelerated the timeline that led directly to Rosa Parks doing the same thing nine months later. And by then, there had already been planning that once Rosa Parks did her thing, they just kicked in the Montgomery bus boycott. That's not how we learn it. And youth and everyone should be more aware of the behind the scenes activities that were put in place to change that status quo. Those are the sorts of things that as youth you're doing right now. Because the Montgomery bus boycott took more than six months to plan. And if it had not been inspired by Claudette Colvin's lawsuit that was going on, that would have pushed back the timeline. So let me fast forward a little bit. Now, let me just say one thing. Everyone knows Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King's very first thing he ever did outside of his little parish in Montgomery, Alabama, the first publicly facing thing was to organize and raise funds for the defense of Claudette Colvin. So when she was 17, she had a kid. She was looked over uh, as being a symbol of the civil rights movement. She was short. She was very dark skinned compared to say Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was middle-aged, well-dressed, respectable, working woman, lighter skinned, articulate, relatable, the better symbol. So she was chosen as a symbol. So Claudette Colvin moved to the Bronx, New York. The Bronx has the most African immigrants of anywhere in the United States. And she worked under the radar at night because she was worried about being killed, flat out, right? They found her and they wanted to honor her. They wanted Peace Lights to play at this thing honoring her and they asked me to speak. So I looked up in that book on the picture I just showed. And the, what jumped out at me was the statement that said she's credited with accelerating the change in the plight of colored people. Now, accelerating a change, I'm an engineer. I graduated with an engineering degree. Accelerating a change in mathematical terms is a second derivative. So interesting territory. I looked it up, Googled, plight of colored people, 1955. And what came up was the lynchings, 4,000 lynchings from the end of the Civil War to 1955. That had an impact on me that gave me an epiphany. You could say legitimately, and this is where Claudette Colvin was from, by the way, where this red circle. So she was no stranger to the inequities that were going on, right? The plight of colored people in 1955 could be legitimately put into the context of deaths per day. So, but importantly, if it could, you know, the, over time, those deaths went down. So the curve kind of looked like this. So eventually that, that timeline went down. A youth, a 15 year old, pushed this curve to the left. And therefore there are people who didn't die. So this woman as a youth, 15 year old, by standing up for her rights, by knowing her rights and standing up for them, literally saved lives. So I start to think, how did this girl learn her rights, right? Because, you know, not necessarily everyone would have known that you, you know, they couldn't make you stand up. Because uh, if, if they wanted to, it's fine, but the law was they could not make you stand up. If there was not another seat, they could not move you, right? Claudette's English teacher took time out of teaching English and taught the class about the Articles of Confederation and really empowered Claudette and her classmates. So you could say, very Colvin literally saved lives. You could extend that and say, because of the influence of Mrs. Geraldine Nesbitt as a teacher, she literally saved lives. Of what she taught that made the difference. And that content would fall under the umbrella of not fully defined peace education. So, Claudette Colvin's story teaches us that peace education literally saved. Learn from the past and look at the future. Let's jump right into the African Union. Six regions, 1.3 million people around the world in the diaspora. Here, document. In the 2063. After I gave that talk at the Bronx, Saving lives. Someone came up to me and said, Mr. Ogina, no one's ever told 
Would you be willing to tell that story the way you just told it to the ambassador from the African Union to the U.S.? Sure, I'd be honored. When I went there, he asked me to review this document, Agenda 2060. So sure. Agenda 2063 calls for peace education, but there is no language in Agenda 2063 to support that. So I've, I've been working towards, towards uh, defining, you know, working towards a process that could use a Pan-African perspective. I didn't hear you. Can you hear me? No? Hello? No? I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay, great, great, yeah. great. All right, so, so there are Pan-African groups that exist. So I suggested to the ambassador and various others that, hey, you know, you got all this Pan-African activity going on start up a Pan-African Curriculum Development Working Group. And with the help of a, a, a professor in, in uh, Senegal, we modeled it, and that's what we're doing. We're gonna have three meetings uh, with uh, two delegates from every country over the course of 24 to 36 months, and that's about $4 million. So we're raising that money. Then we're gonna visit all the tribes, and we are also going to be uh, uh, involving all the tribes. Now we know that the topics for peace education are not really defined, but we know whatever they come up to be, and this group will define them, they all sit on a, a foundation of human rights. So when this curriculum eventually does happen, if it doesn't happen according to some facilitation, it's not going to happen in Africa till say 2035. And most people agree with that because that's sometime after the SDGs. But if we're able to get on top of this process, we can pull that timeline up by a decade. And Claudette Colvin's story teaches us that that literally saves lives. As far as the human rights piece goes, you know, we, we know that uh, you know, human rights has to become part of the discussion. So Youth for Human Rights, one of our partners, has, a, has already a, a curriculum for that. So it's just a cut and paste sort of thing. So there's a lot of ways to make this be a shorter timeline. And again, for those who prepare for it, you can benefit from inculcating these, these sorts of things into your, your culture. And the, the goal here is to pull that timeline up and literally save lives while, while um, preparing everything. NGO of Project Peace Lights was formed to do that. And finally, let me bring, it, bring us back here. Your role is to manifest the future. In order to do that, you've got to prepare yourselves. So you've got to know that you have this power collectively. You cannot do this by yourself. You've got to partner with each other in order to be able to pull, pull this off. Taking care of yourself, keeping yourself in balance so that you can you know, put your oxygen mask on first, right? Keep learning. Learn the history behind different conflicts and different ways of, of dealing with them. Becoming consciously competent in your situation. You, there's a lot of interfaith uh, struggle in the world. So working with interfaith groups is going to be a very productive uh, path forward for all of you. And I suggest and, and really uh, recommend that you find interfaith groups or create them to do that. Uh, keep pushing. You cannot afford a 50 year or a 20 year wait because you didn't grasp your power and then take advantage of it. So really try and, try and uh, be aware of that. And organization is a big part of that, obviously. Engaging the diaspora, and if you're from Africa, is, is usually important. And that goes both ways. And finally, uh, I said you can't do it alone. Have fun, manifest your future. But finally, uh, when you want something, the universe conspires to help you get it. So know that. In this journey I'm on, we're going to accelerate peace education. I have no doubt. But the universe has been putting the pieces in front of me because that is the energy that has been put out. Last slide. Know that everything you're doing is saving lives every day. Any acceleration of those timelines, every action that accelerates those timelines literally saves lives. So you should feel empowered and inspired based on all of these uh, actions that you are doing and taking upon yourself. So thank you very much, much appreciated. And all the best. I'm a resource. If anyone wants to reach out to me, please, uh, anything I can do. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Pitch Regine. Um, that was uh, inspiring. It was educating. It was informative. And 
he was encouraging as well. Sorry, my video is not coming up. My connection has gone so bad. So I need to, I, I need you to hear me more than you can see me, but I will sort it out soon. So thank you for that. Uh, peace, Project Peace Light and Peace Light are things uh, everyone should start looking forward to and getting to know more about it. Um, with the website and with the lot of information that is showing on the website, Africa needs to key in. Africa needs to key in and you know, make the world a better place. But I want to thank uh, Mr. Pete Regina, especially for bringing in that light symbol. You know, in the world today, every ha everything has to do with symbol. Everything. You are in a religious organization, you're a political party, you should have your slogan. Everything has to do with a uh, symbol. And for you uh, bringing up a symbol of peace is so much more because there is nothing that cannot be achieved on earth without peace. Say from the family, it's gonna be in a serious war between the husband and the wife and the kids. If there's no peace in the workplaces, everything. So Project uh, Peace Slides is a symbol everyone has to adapt and you know get used to. We need to start showing it uh, in the lobby, at homes, in offices, everywhere, so that people will get conscious and you know um, they become you know aware that without peace there is no progress. And on that note, I want to um, welcome our next speaker. She is a Bangladeshi living in the United States for higher studies. She has been a strong voice of climate advocacy for a very, from a very young age and is currently serving as the executive director of Project uh, Team 54 Project International. She is also very vocal about human rights. You will get to hear this. And she has been working to raise awareness in our community about the rights we all have as humans. Her name is Jasmine Akta Promi, and she has been doing a lot for, for the world through Team 54 Project. And this has led to, you know, seeing her represent our country at the United Nations headquarters as a young delegate for Bangladesh in 2019. She has been doing a lot and she is doing more, but it's better we hear from her. Please join me to welcome Jasmine Promi. Thank you, thank you so much, John Bosco, uh, for the wonderful introduction, and thanks for everyone for taking the time to uh, listen to all of us uh, who are sharing our thoughts and views today. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by um, wishing all of you a very happy International Youth Day. That's why we are here today, right? And we are celebrating the power of youth, the power of unity. Now, why do I say the power of unity? In like based on everything we just heard from Peter, does that tell you something? Does that tell you that our pre the previous years, the prior years before this generation, there were so many differences that was so visible to people, that was so important to people, right? They, they, th these differences separated us, be it based on color. Uh, obviously, uh, Peter t uh, talked a lot about you know how it was based on color, on gender, and there are other other uh, factors based on which uh, there were differences. There still are actually, like nationality right ethnicity so keeping all those things in mind what i think is that we have taken a huge leap uh considering the position where we used to be like peter mentioned right and i think that my generation or this generation the the generation that we call you today for today right uh they are much more aware of these things they are actually raising the voice they're actually taking the time to learn they're um you know pointing out that, okay, these differences does not mean anything. We're all the, uh, you know, children of the earth. We all belong to the same race. There is no other race. There is no other differences. We are all human beings, right? And I think that this generation, this uh, in this point in time, has been more vocal and aware than any other point in history. So that is the hope for unity. This is why you to me means unity. So that's why what we are doing today is we are celebrating the youth. We're celebrating the power of youth and the symbolism of unity, right? Uh, one more thing that I, I think about uh, today's youth is that um, 
you know, we are much better equipped than what our previous generations at our age used to be. For example, if I speak a little bit about uh, our president sitting here today, uh, Daniel, when uh, so I'm 23, when Daniel was 23, I'm pretty sure he did not have internet like I do. He did not have resources to learn like I do. He did not have resources to gain skills like I do, right? Today, I did, like I'm sitting at my home in this pandemic, I'm talking to all of you and I don't know, you you guys are connecting from all around the world right and you're getting this information from the internet and i'm able to do that but daniel did not have this opportunity right i can't imagine him doing that uh, at, at my age but i have that ability i have that opportunity to do that i uh, even if it's not a seminar or you know a, a workshop or something like that i can take online courses to gain uh, hands on uh, knowledge about or like you know just to learn a new skill be it digital marketing be it you know some some other course some coding course whatever right so what's my point my point is that if you have the opportunity use it utilize it Okay, because the world is changing and uh, it's my message to the youth would be that, you know, take, take as it comes, because if you, if you don't uh, dip your hand in the flowing river, the water would be far off and you would be left behind, you know, so uh, just take this experience to take the skills and start learning because uh, we as youth represent change. We represent innovation. So if you are not uh, experienced with what is going on right now, you will have no idea what will be happening tomorrow. And you should be, you yourself should be the flag bearer of change, of, you know, of, of innovation. And um, I think that, um, you know, I, I always had this vision that uh, we will always address the problems that are today so that we know where to go tomorrow right uh like as, as youth and i think that youth has this potential we 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 have that energy that intention uh we just need that understanding and that awareness so that we can implement that and use our energy and our potential for a better future and talking about peace um i would very much like to be very hopeful and give out a you know a very hopeful message, but it is um, it is sad that I have to say this that half of the people that are that we call you today, and more than half actually, I, I I wouldn't go into statistics, but just to give you an idea, like a lot of the nations today, as we speak, are uh, in war, war tour zones, right? And a lot of the children that are being raised here, can you imagine what kind of upbringing they're getting? What is their environment? Let that sink in for a while. If you and I were to grow in an environment like this, would you be talking peace here right now? I don't think so. Your first priority would be how to have your uh, proper housing, how to have a living, how to have security so that you are not dead tomorrow. When you wake up, you don't see someone's dying, right? So. That, that kind of environment, where when you're growing up in that kind of environment, can you, can you realize, can you start to understand how that person turns out to be in their adulthood? Do you think you can go and talk peace to them? Is it that easy? It isn't, right? It's not easy for them. So can you imagine what the future adult generation is going to be like? So... What's my point? My point is that we have to start addressing these things. And we are far beyond the, I keep saying this thing, we are far beyond the point of just talking. But I'm really tired of talking because the world I inherited from the previous generation is not in peace. And it's not going to be in peace. And if we don't take action now, I don't think we are going anywhere. So this is why I think UN calls this decade the decade of action. Okay, it's good. It's good that we're talking about it. it. It's good that we're raising the awareness. We're, you know, uh, making people conscious of this, but that is simply not enough. Right. So uh, my message would be, yes, get yourself educated, learn, be aware, spread awareness, but also come up with an action plan. Uh, decide where you're at. Uh, understand where you're at. Decide where you want to go and plan out how you want to get there. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, with that, uh, over to John Bascom.
Thank you, uh, Jasmine, for this wonderful presentation. You see, the world is going um, digital and it's getting better because uh, there was a time when internet never existed. No one knew what to do, what not to do, or how even to do them. But today, one can simply go to you know, go to Google, get information. We have more freedom of doing things now. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to, you know, get the best we can from this world, from this generation, from the earth, from the globe as a whole, because yesterday was different from today. We do not know how tomorrow will be. So the best time um, to, you know, to live a life of positivity, a life of impact it's now so quickly we would like to um go to another speaker but i want to implore all of us we we do not have a lot of time and some viewers are already you know leaving the program so we can you know keep to our time so next we are going to uh listen to another powerful uh, presentation from one of us here. Um, sorry, I'm having a view. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm lost, sir. Yep. Okay, so um, the next presentation we're gonna get from um, Alicia Rashid. Alicia, please, um, I would like you to do your introduction by yourself. Since you okay. know us, but you know yourself better than we do know you, it will be easier for you to give a summary introduction of yourself. And uh, so we can use the time uh, better. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, okay, guys. So I do, firstly, I want to apologize for my video. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty on my end here. So um, you'll just be hearing me if that's okay. Um, so my name is Good Morning, first of all, and um, happy International Youth Day to one and all, and um, to all our viewers, the youths, and um, my prestigious panel. Uh, my name is Alicia Rashid, and I am the owner and founder of Fimperial Brands, a recently formed company that was established with the intent to empower the lives of women and youths through agriculture and um, promoting food security. Um, I am from the Caribbean. I was born and raised in the, the country called Guyana, um, which is a, uh, which is a uh, country that is rich in agricultural um, activities um, as economic activity. Um, firstly, I want to um, congratulate the youth uh, for their accomplishment and participation thus far in the global, the recent global pandemic, um, surviving through the many drastic and life altering changes over such a short period of time is really not a simple task. And, um, you know, we have made it true so far, thus far. And, um, you know, I want to congratulate and thank everyone that has been, um, you know, doing their selfless duties and are continuing to do so. Um, you know, as youths, we need to take our stands now, prepare and make implementations for the future. As my colleague said just now, Jasmine, you know, she made a very um, valid point uh, when she said, you know, there is, um, it's, it's right for us and it's very good that we're pointing out um, the wrongs and, you know, we're, we're trying, we're raising awareness, but um, what happens to the action, you know, and this is um, the time for action, you know, I, I really like that quote and I do believe in that as well and it's also a mantra of mine and, um, you know, as the as great Mahatma Gandhi quoted and, um, and I quote, be the change you want to see and this is a quote that has always been an inspiration to me and it's it's something that is a quote that had made me into the person I am today, you know, growing up as a young teenager, you know, I was um, 
had all these opinions and thoughts about life and, and women and, and agriculture. And um, I always thought to myself, like, okay, yes, I'm thinking this, but what if it makes sense? And what if, you know, anybody would listen to me? And, uh, you know, I, I have been that change, you know, growing older and, and, you know, having a more mature mind, you know, my thoughts and my opinions only became stronger. And um, today, you know, I am a product of that, you know, I've, I've, I'm being the change that I wanted to see in my country, in my society, and even the Caribbean as a whole, you know. So um, today, as we celebrate International Youth Day, uh, I just wanted to shed a little light on my current project as a youth and how I intend to create positive impacts and results. Um, as an agricultural and a female activist, you know, I have um, seen the need for more employment for women and the need to expand the agriculture sector and promote food security. And being born in a country um, like Guyana, you know, where it, um, we strive on agricultural activities as our main, one of our main economic activity, you know, has truly enhanced my knowledge and love for agriculture. And uh, which is why today I've chosen this path, you know, and um, even though I have migrated to um, another country right here in the Caribbean, and it's known as the island of Trinidad and Tobago, you know, um, this is, this is my dream and I'm, I'm currently living and, um, you know, making my dream possible. Um, my most recent and active project is, has been a feasibility study on how economical, you know, crop cultivation is for women and youths to be involved as a business venture. And um, I managed to finance um, this project by myself. And, um, you know, the end result is going to really be a game changer for me. And um, I have so many, I have two groups of women and youths, um, one that is presently here in Trinidad and Tobago that I'm working with to come on board with me um, in the bigger project, which is going to be um, early next year. And, um, you know, I have my other group, my other team in Guyana, and we're mostly focused on um, rice production in Guyana and transfer of technology to teach uh, to other countries that are big importers of rice. You know, we could actually um, teach you how we do so in Guyana because we have a very um, powerful industry, rice industry there in Guyana. So um, as a youth, this is this has been one of my game plan and um, I'm, I've been working tirelessly, you know, to improve the lives of women and youth. And um, as a youth, I'm very, um, I'm very, I'm very proud of, of what I've accomplished thus far. And I just want to send a, um, a message out there to youth. You know, I know that we uh, as young teenagers, even as children, you know, we come up with all these great ideas and we wonder to ourselves and we say, you know, I wonder if I make sense and I wonder if I'll be heard. I wonder, you know, you wonder so many things and some people are not brave enough, you know, to come forward and say, Hey, um, this is what I think or to share their ideas to the world uh, without even acknowledging or knowing that that might be a game changer for the world, you know, and I want to advise you youths out there and children and young teenagers that do not be afraid and, um, you know, stand up for your rights, you know, and um, if you if you see that there there is something you could implement to make life easier and better for um, the people around you, your country, your community, and um, eventually the world as a whole, you know, then do come forward. Do not be shy. Be brave. Just be brave. I have I have achieved um, where I am thus far because I have been brave, and I've been able to speak out. Um, on my opinions and my ideas. And um, I just want to encourage you to do so and to be a game changer. And I, I want to thank you all today in this panel, you know, all these wonderful people. It's such a pleasure and honor to be amongst you on such a, um, a great day and to be celebrating with you guys. And um, John Bosco, thank you so much for the invite. You know, um, it's always been a pleasure working with you. And I've always, um, you know, meet new people and it's, it's always a great opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alicia. Um, 
you see, Alicia is um, a, so, someone to look, you know, look up to. She's a role model. When people are worried and scared of going into agriculture, some people say it's a poor man business. She has gone into the sector and, you know, proved the whole, you know, people, I mean, the people who are getting this whole idea, she has proved them wrong with all the achievements she has made. And if you look at it now, she's not just, you know, making profit from it. She's also sowing into the lives of people. She's leaving a legacy. She has put smiles in people's face. She has, you know, given back life to people who are despaired, people who are worried about, you know, what to do and what not to do. And this goes down to encourage every one of us, especially those who are coming up, that there is nothing that cannot, you know, give you the desired success you want in life. It all boils down to your tenacity, how much effort you are putting, how much research you are doing, you know, to find out what you can do about that sector. So let us go out and, you know, do the best we can and then do, you know, turn the small things that people neglect into big things and you see people flocking into the sector. I want to thank you once more. And next, uh, we are going to hear from Miss um, Gail. Sorry if I did not pronounce that well. Uh, is Miss Gail Wool. Please, sorry, you have to help us pronounce it because this is a learning stage. So when you pronounce it by yourself, I will also be able to, you know, I will learn from you. Kindly introduce <laughs> yourself and, uh, you know, feed us with the, you know, wonderful information you have for us today. Thank you. Thank you, John Bosco. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Jasmine? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, well, pronounce my name, Gail, G-A-I-L, like sail, but with a G. And um, Gail Woon, and like Alicia, um, I have Guyanese heritage. Um, my father was from Guyana, and uh, he came to the Bahamas in his youth and um, basically built our island, our infrastructure and everything. Um, so... I run an NGO called Earth Care, and I'm a marine biologist. Um, I need to share my screen with you to start my presentation. Give me a moment. Okay, good afternoon. It's my profound pleasure to address you on this International Youth Day. First, please accept my heartfelt, profound apology for the state of the world that the older generations are leaving the youth of today for you to deal with. I've been preaching for decades to mostly deaf ears about the ways we could change our lifestyles in order for your future to be a better place. I'm so sorry that very few people listened and took my words to heart. Let me share with you who I am and what the NGO called Earth Care that I founded in 1988 is and does in a short video.
is an environmental education NGO, non-governmental organization, that works on current environmental issues affecting the environment. Our mission is to empower students and teachers to get involved and be proactive with their voice. We encourage them to write to the government of the Bahamas and express their views on current environmental issues. We also have a Saturday program in which students learn about various issues such as pollution, habitat destruction, mangrove protection, invasive species, sustainable fisheries, eco-art, climate change, healthy lifestyles, sustainable transportation, and many others. Fun field trips follow these lessons. The path to peace is through love, real love, unconditional love. Loving yourself unconditionally is the path to peace. It's your greatest act of service to humanity. Loving yourself ends lack, ends pain, and ends suffering. Loving yourself unconditionally is putting God first. Loving yourself unconditionally is the path to peace. Enhanced socioeconomic progress. What does this mean? Socioeconomic development is the process of social and economic development in a society. Socioeconomic development is measured with indicators such as GDP, life expectancy, literacy, and levels of employment. Socioeconomic factors include occupation, education, income, wealth, and where someone lives. Social economic progress should include every section of the society as it aims to ensure that everyone meet their basic needs that are essential to live a life of dignity. In my country, the Bahamas, we have a very beautiful country. We are a proud people. We've been blessed with an organization that manages our many national parks called the Bahamas National Trust. We've entrusted them to guard our natural heritage and environment. Up until very recently, our economy was largely based on tourism. We had become very good at attracting and keeping satisfied tourists coming back to our crystal clear water shores. We have a vibrant banking industry and some of the islands have various industries. We don't have a great life expectancy, however, due to a preponderance of preventable diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. We unfortunately love fast foods, high fat foods and sugary drinks. Thankfully, our youth are learning how to live healthy lifestyles, eating to live instead of living to eat and exercising. Our employment levels have been fairly stable in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. In the 2000s, we had some setbacks with more frequent climate change hurricanes. On my island in particular, Grand Bahama Island, we were negatively impacted by several mega storms, hurricanes Floyd, Francis, Jean, and Matthew, which caused various levels of flooding, and most recently, the monster storm, Hurricane Dorian. Hurricane Dorian flattened, flooded, sorry, flooded our flat island with 20 to 25 foot storm surge and 70% of the entire island was underwater for at least 40 straight hours. My island is still trying to rebuild almost one year later. This is the hurricane shelter that my daughter and I went to during Hurricane Dorian. The roof blew off while we were under it and shortly thereafter I got a call from the Washington Post asking how we were doing. We still have people displaced, homeless, and or living in tents with no power or water. 11 months after Hurricane Dorian, the struggle is real. This is our reality. We have to fill and tote fresh water from stations throughout the island of Grand Bahama. Our original source of city fresh water was inundated by saltwater intrusion from climate change Hurricane Dorian. Saltwater intrusion is rarely reversed in the water table. The water which flows out of our taps is saltwater, non-potable. We can bathe with it, but not cook or wash dishes. So every family has to fill containers with fresh water and take it to our homes for use by our families. And now we have to do this in the age of COVID-19. Dorian also devastated the islands of Abaco. An entire community of mostly undocumented immigrants was almost completely decimated there. The government totals for deaths are still in dispute, but the last count I heard was 78 people dead from Dorian. Some of our citizens left the country and some have chosen not to return, basically making them climate change refugees. Our education system leaves a bit to be desired. Our national grade average has been D for a few years now. Yes, you heard correctly, not A, not B, not C, but grade D. There are private schools that have better grade averages. However, most are out of the reach of the middle class and lower than middle class families income because of the high tuition required. 
When students leave the secondary schools, many are able to go on to college level. When this happens, sometimes we get what we call a brain drain. Students who go away for college, many tend to stay overseas rather than come home to use their knowledge to make our country a better place. One of the reasons for this is we have a limited amount of jobs and some of the better paying jobs are given to expatriates who are supposed to train Bahamian citizens to replace them and take their jobs, but many tend to stay on the job for years, not making any openings for the youth. Hello, girl. Hello. Yes, um, our Zoom meeting might end in a few minutes. So um, I sent a link in the chat box. I would like you to, you know, head on to the link and continue there. So, uh, when did it end? Oh. We're still going on. Oh. Um, the meeting time was sorry. a by Zoom, so we can go on. I just got notified. I, I'm sorry, what's happening? You can continue, don't worry. Everything is fine now. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, wealth presents a source of security, providing a measure of a household's ability to meet emergencies, absorb economic shocks, or provide the means to live comfortably. Like most countries, we have a disparity in people with large wealth reserves and people without large wealth reserves. Finally, I will address the elephant in the room, COVID-19, the disease caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. In December, the novel new virus was identified. Since then, it is safe to say that over our entire globe, our lives have turned completely upside down and not in a good way. As of March 12th, we had no cases in the Bahamas. As uh, the Bahamas is experiencing our second surge now, we have attained the dubious title as the worst country dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are listed as 184 out of 184 countries. Many of our islands are on complete lockdown. Our healthcare system is being tested beyond its capacity. My particular island of Grand Bahama is a COVID-19 hotspot. So no travel is allowed into or out of the island. Our first lockdown began in the third week of March, 2020. Some families have had no income since then. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know that as youth, you are going to need to have your wits about you. By that I mean, learn as much as you can from mentors. Become as computer literate as possible. Innovate. Think of unique ways to navigate and make a living in this post COVID-19 world. I don't think you can afford to wait for a vaccine. I think the time is now for you to grab the projects that you wanna do and become your own entrepreneur. Develop and run your own businesses. Utilize the funding agencies that are available. Write grant proposals. Apply to get funding to start your own businesses. Use the internet and become savvy about technology. We, the elders, are counting on you to clean up the mess that we have given you and to make this world and your countries better places, sustainable places, clean places, and places that you would want to raise your own families. You have the means, your youth, and your brain power. I cannot wait to see what you come up with. And I also want to mention that in the Bahamas, we are blessed to have uh, many NGOs that work together uh, on environmental issues and various issues, uh, socioeconomic issues, and uh, I've been blessed to be able to work closely with uh, Mr. Joseph Darville of Save the Bays and Rashima Ingram of the Waterkeeper Alliance. And uh, we've been able to do some projects which were um, part of the United Nations Sustainable Goals Program. We were able to plant mangroves last summer with environmental groups who traveled all the way from China and their youth to, to work with us. And so that was a very, very wonderful and um, gratifying week that those people were here in on our island so uh thank you for inviting me to address you on this very important international youth day
thank you girl for this wonderful presentation we see um the earth care is doing a lot and there's this popular saying that, uh, that goes like this it says uh, the way you make your bed so you will lie on it so this calls us to take care of the, uh, uh, the mother earth because if we do not take care of the earth by ourselves we will not have anything out of it so quickly i would like uh, us to go to the next speaker uh, the next speaker is someone we know very well he has been doing a lot in this uh, global program championing a lot of courses uh, he's no other person than dr daniel uh, the founder and president of team 54 project international it's a us-based group that finds innovative ways to advocate and push for climate solutions so i would like uh, dr daniel to tell us more about himself and then give us the good news of today because all we've been listening to is all good news it's all messages of peace it's all messages of progress it's all messages of how the youth can become better youth and not disappoint the coming generation so welcome once again dr daniel Bujie. the floor is yours Yes, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, John Bosco, the moderator and the conveyor of this stuff. And thank you so much, uh, my staffs and my members and partners across the Caribbean, across Africa, and my partners in the United States that have joined us and those online that are uh, reaching out to us. Um, happy International Youth Day. I am so blessed when John Bosco and his organization, Peace Campaign, brought the concept of us partnering together to add value and content into the space, a space that is already bedeviled with a, a pandemic that uh, people are still trying to address. So it is indeed great that young people, just like John Bosco, myself, Jasmine, you know, and my even good friend from BioSC, uh, Miss Francis, are all working hand in hand to change the narrative, like Gil has said that uh, it's unfortunate that what has been handed over to us, us is a battered nation or a battered planet. Uh, but it is still up to us to make it right. And the window we have is not so wide again. It requires us, you know, coming together, be truthful to ourselves, using facts and figures, and us trying to use the global knowledge and understanding of technology and applying it locally. It is a global understanding, it's a global movement, it's a global problem, but we need to act locally. It's uh, bringing it down to the local level that actually have that ripple effect and that can cause it. On that note, I want to, um, uh, again, uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm the founder of Team 54 Project, and we're working hand in hand to ensure that we bring, um, we bring innovative, smart, technologically-based um, um, solutions to simple day challenges to address the climate struggle. Uh, we understand that the environmental issues are very complex. And people always forget that whatever enters into the environment trickle down, trickles down into your life, your health, your security, your education, your peace, um, um, every aspect of your even social economic factor. Even, even the spread of cancer has environmental basis. So in as much as you think it is so complex, it doesn't affect you, it's all about strikes, which is not, people should realize that the environment is way bigger. And whatever trickles down into that environment pollutes every other system that is operating, distorts every other thing that we so hold dear to. And that's why it's important that we begin to see newer ways of finding and resolving our issues, especially conflicts, newer ways of bringing on board young people. Like Gail has said, for the last uh, 50 to 60 years, young people have been alienated in global uh, 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 governance, global issue, decision-making issues that have direct impact in their life. They have, but in the last two, three years, young people have woken up to remind the adults in the house 
that a time, the time has come to change that narrative that what were you doing all this while, while the house was burning? You are now giving us ashes to build from, whereas your own fathers gave you halls. All you needed to do was give us skyscrapers. So, so it's, it's just unfortunate that we are where we are. But I've always known this, that anytime mankind is bedeviled with a lot of problems, smart people, intelligent people, people that love, people that want to find solutions, you know, uh, uh, social changes always rise up. But you cannot rise up if there is no environment of peace. No matter what we are doing today, if there is no peace, there can never be progress. And peace in itself is so abstract that people define peace relative to war. No, if you don't have peace in your home, in your family, there can never be progress. You understand? So we should start changing that mentality that peace has to do with uh, conflict, active conflict, strive, uh, communal clash, and things like that. No, peace is, um, is an environment or is an intentional eco space you create to bring about the establishment of prosperity, to bring about the establishment of love, to bring about the establishment of compassion, to drag people along to be more inclusive. So uh, the theme of the event of bringing in peace into socioeconomic productivity or socioeconomic enhancement that we can teach young people is indeed very uh, apt especially knowing that the international global team is how do we engage young people? You can't engage young people if the environment is not right. You can't engage young people if you do not know the demographic of these young people. Young people are divided into a lot of categories. We have toddlers, we have infants who cannot even make decisions for themselves. We have, uh, we have high school students, we have elementary students, we have university students, we have those that transition from university into the working class group. We have those that are involved in politics. All of all these groups of youths or young people have an uh, interest at heart. So if we must get them engaged so that we can create a future that can uh, bring about peace and sustainable development, their interest is priority. For the first time in a very long time, people are listening to young people because they can't go anywhere again because the lies do not hold water again. There is no young person in this world, especially in my country, I speak for my country, that does not understand Nigeria, that does not understand that whatever is going on is not working again. It is not working again. The lies have to stop. The style of governance has to change. Governance now must be with human face. All these capitalistic uh, principles and philosophy cannot work. Why? COVID has exposed that. COVID has told us that we have been doing lip service to sustainable development goals. Those goals that will empower people. Those goals that will bring people on board. Those goals that will empower youth. Those goals that will gradually move us from destroying the environment to creating new ideas. These are ways and things and times that young people need to rise up. I will also want to bring the attention to the world especially those of our friends on Facebook watching us, that a time will come when you need to give account, you know, of what you've done with your life, whether you like it or not, your life has an accountability clause. You understand? For many people, religious faith, cultural beliefs helps them, you know, uh, maintain some bit of sanity. But for those that do not have all those stuff, it drives people crazy. The environment now is polarizing people on every level. And this is the time for everybody to step back. No one is the enemy. The intentions may look very complex. Our focus should be on humanity. Our focus should be on all those that we have left behind. And we have left behind our young people. We did not bring them to speed on what, uh, after the World War, on what progress should be in the next 50 years. We did not bring them to speed on local issues. We did not bring them to speed on empowering and and using them to replace the older ones in elective position. We did not give them quota systems on how to do. We always select the worst of them to represent their interests. We use them in political, in political strides or political campaigns. We use them to carry our bags while the house burn. So the, the truth of the matter is this, if we are going to look back, our kids are going to look back at 
the last uh, 50 to 40 years is definitely a sad narrative. And it is important we start to create this eco space of peace. Peace will only come when we ensure that every other person that has been marginalized, has been left there, is being heard. When we reach consensus agreement, when we show compassion to everyone, irrespective of the skin, when we listen, listen to the voice of reasoning, when we throw away political party mantra and bring on board human manifestos. It is time people realize that political parties are just a vehicle for you to actualize a bigger vision. You are not supposed to carry your political ideology at the expense of humanity. And the more we begin to see all this, the more we begin to see that all the things we are doing are the things causing these conflicts, are the things causing, uh, you know, the strive, are the things causing the situation where we found ourselves. You know, because of the absence of peace, people are not trustworthy. Governments are not, they don't think they are responsible to people. Even the citizenry keep on electing people they know cannot do better. Because it's one thing to always accuse those that govern. It's another thing to look at the people and the society from where they come out. Leaders that you see are a representation of the society. Whether they are in the majority or the minority is a different thing. So it's up to us to start to teach ourselves you know, those fundamental principles that when you are put in place uh, in a position of power, what you are supposed to do is create more ladders for people to join you, replace you, and sustain that, um, uh, that vision. Um, I will end by saying this, that the International uh, Youth Day is a day that has been recognized all over the world. As we speak, thousands of events are going on. I have been joining uh, about six other events, and I have about nine more events to speak on. But this is very important, and this is what I have said to every single person, that development of peace and engaging youth is an intentional decision. If you choose not to involve youth, all you are saying is that the existence of your nation will perish. If you choose not to bring young people on board or people that have been marginalized, all you are setting yourself up for is for chaos and anarchy. It is what we have seen in the US, we are seeing in Europe, we are seeing even in international organizations in WHO. It is time to press the button and bring on board peace. It is time to listen to those that have been forsaken. It is time to start telling your children to prepare for the century. And in preparing for the century, they need to be prepared and they need to know the technology of today, the skills of yesterday, the governance style of yesterday, the uh, industrial philosophy and the socio-economical parameters of yesterday is not working. It took an invisible virus or it took an invisible organism to teach us that we've been deceiving ourselves. And the sooner we get all this on board, the sooner we start to look for uh, the interest of the people, the sooner we start to frame government policies uh, to, to cater for environmental consideration, socioeconomic parameters, and the interest of our continuity as a human race, the better for us. And when we start to create that peaceful eco space, other animals, people forget that other animals that cannot talk are looking up to us to be responsible. It's often sad that people don't know that it's not only about you, it's also about that animal, about the goats, about the lions, about those snakes, about those uh, animals that are extinct. And when you think your life doesn't mean anything, then what do you say for those animals that cannot speak for themselves? So uh, on that note, I want to thank all young people all over the world. I want to thank John Bosco and the entire team. I want to thank Jasmine. I also want to thank Gil and many of the United Nations officers. I've seen one of our fellows and mentor, Dr. Michael uh, Hove. Thank you for joining. You will have also a time to speak. Thank you, BioEscape Francis. You will also have time to speak to speak, but the most important thing is that I know all of us are doing excellently well in all our adventure. We need to amplify this message that if we are to move forward post COVID, that any plan done without changing what has brought us to the COVID time will only amount to failure for us. And unless we start to think of building a greener world, a world that will have no pollution, a world that will have something to give back to the people, the better for us. Thank you, John Bosco, and then God bless everybody. Happy International Youth Day.
Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Happy International Youth Day. I want to thank everyone who has spoken. And uh, at the same time, welcome uh, Dr. Michael. Dr. Michael, um, you already know what we are working on. We are trying to tell this generation that they must not fail the coming generation. I would like to, uh, if you have some words for us, would like you to speak to us, um, add your voice to this message, because the youth of today is focused on some vanity things, money, influence, and all of that. But then it's, it's well known that when the youth's full exuberance has passed, when responsibility comes in, the regular youth who is now old will begin to say, I wish I knew all of these things. And that is why we are doing our best to pass this message so that no one will say he wish he knew or he wish he had. Dr. Michael, do you have uh, some you words for us? Thank you so very much. I must commend uh, Dr. Daniel for this inspiration. Daniel has always been one of the uh, lights at the uh, Cornell University laboratory where we had a uh, our fellowship and his contributions has always been quite exceptional and it's a great inspiration to us all, not only in Nigeria but in Africa. Yeah, the area of the youth is one of the areas that have always been of interest to me. Uh, right from my high school, I've always loved to interact with the younger generation. Number one, we need to ask ourselves. What is the inheritance we are going to pass down to our children? The natural inheritance, the earth that you are going to leave for these children. It's not the, if I leave a million dollars for my daughter and I leave a dying earth for my daughter, that million dollar may not last 365 days because of the challenges this younger generation will face. So I think this older generation should think more of the earth as an inheritance we are handing over to them. The second thing is we should ensure that in our educational system and from home, we help them to imbibe the culture of a healthy environment and to be willing to pay the price for a healthier environment. They should be willing to pay the price for the heavier environment. That is the younger generation. And also, we in the older generation should ensure that we don't give polluted earth as inheritance and they want to give a cleaner earth. We live in this world maybe for 100 years, 90 years, and you are living the world with, let me say, 50 gigabytes of carbon dioxide as inheritance. A young child is coming in to inherit that polluted earth. And he has another maybe 70, 80 years more to live. So these are the challenges we should think about and work on in our age. I'd also like to mention that our educational system has to change. Our vision must change. In many of our institutions from elementary to the university, most of the curriculum, sorry to say, are dying, others are dead. I'm proud to mention that there are pockets of institutions where the curriculum has shifted to the 21st century generation. Uh, where I am currently, we are working now in the African Center for Innovative and Transformative STEM Education. It's a World Bank uh, project. Here we have transformed science education into contemporary learning and curriculum, 21st century skills. These are the kind of uh, vision we should be selling to the Nigerian system. We should ensure that we keep on pushing, keep on pushing, keep on pushing in the media. And I trust this will be about to change. Another thing we must do, we must go on social media extensively and ensure that we give a paradigm shift to our younger generation. As Daniel said, 
And uh, as uh, John Bosco has also mentioned, their psyche is in a totally different. This is not a matter of religion. I have seen children who are in different, you know, singers about religion, and yet this flashy and highly worldly-mindedness is a problem to them. So it's not a matter of religion at all. I have met them. I have seen children or people you would think they are real uh, strong clergy, and you still find children from their background, they are so carnally minded about things of this world. He wants to see you wearing a $500 shoe, and this boy is thinking, in the next two weeks, I want to buy it. And he's not concentrating on what will benefit his character, what will benefit his future. He's looking for something to do in one week and buy that shoe and then show you, I got your shoe, man. So these are the things we must go on social media. And then finally, uh, celebrity. Many of them are not helping at the younger generation. Because when you portray too much of uh, flashy things, worldly things, to so these children, as, that is what has made me who I am. If the kind of dress I wear is what has made me who I am, and I portray to them, and I tell them, this is, this is life. This is what the world is all about. You are shifting their thinking to the wrong direction. And they will not value education. They won't value environmental ethics. They will only value whatever I do to get it is the real thing. So our celebrity too needs to really imbibe this culture and pass it on to the generation. Finally, advertisement. I found some of our adverts going on in Nigeria and other parts of the world. Some of them, they value the exhibit. Sometimes it doesn't help our younger generation. I think these are some of the points I would like to share. Thank you very much. Sir. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, everyone, for staying on for this long call. It has gotten longer than we, we, we planned, but it's getting longer for good because if we do not pass this message across, we, we may have a lot of apologies to render to the upcoming generation. And like the doc doctor has said now, it's, it's so sad when you look at the public and those things that are supposed to be, you know, done in the hiding because they are, they don't seem good to the society. They are rather what, you know, is being portrayed for general view in these days. You go to the internet, you go to social media, everywhere people want to be noticed. And unfortunately, they want to be noticed for doing the wrong thing. And uh, it's, it's time for us to change. And that is why we're bringing out this message. Anything that has a starting date can also have a, an ending date. We know how we got here and we can begin to retrace our steps and make this uh, life worth living and make the message of peace. Um, you know, we make this word peace, we make, we make it a family word. That's why I like some organization, uh, religious organizations. You know, when you go to their, uh, for their service, you hear them mentioning peace, peace, peace. It's not just for fancy, they are doing it for a purpose so that they register the word peace in the mind of all the people who come there. I, I wanna ask some questions right now and uh, I'm going to take also questions that our participants and uh, viewers are asking on various platforms where we are airing this um, Hello, meeting. John Bosco. Yeah. Yes, um, Ms. Francis of Bioescape just joined. Okay, I'm trying to see if she's here. Yes, yeah, she's here. Okay, yeah, she she's here. Okay, I was about to uh, ask questions and then take questions from our viewers. But then I, I would like us to also hear from Francis. Francis has uh, the same message of peace for us. Um, hello, Francis. Are you there? Yes, she's there. Francis. Hello, Francis. Um, uh, it appears she's having connection issues. So while we wait for Francis, um, 
while we wait for Francis, I want to ask a couple of questions. And uh, one of these questions that bothers the youth is what does it mean when you say youth engagement and what benefits and challenges are, you know, are embedded in this youth engagement? Because the word engagement, you know, it could mean various things. And uh, in recent times, especially from the United Nations, the youth are beginning to hear engage, engage, engage. So the question is, in what manner are the youth expected to engage? And what are the benefits and challenges of this meaningful uh, engagement? I'm throwing this question to Dr. Daniel. And after he has uh, helped us with this uh, question, if someone else has an answer to it, he should also help us. Okay, thank you. I wanted to come last, but, but thank you. Yes, and you have asked a very important question. And sadly, these are questions at the national level that people have not been able to explain. What does it mean or how do I engage youth meaningfully towards achieving sustainable development goal? Now, at the UN level, from all my interaction with the UN, because I spoke at the UN uh, General Assembly in September about seven months ago. Now, there's a definition for youthful engagement towards sustainable development goal. Now, that definition says that, I'm paraphrasing, it says that it's an intentional in quotes, because youth have definition. For us in Team 54 Project, being a youth is at heart. If you have the vitality, if you have the, the strength within, the willingness, the the, the like-mindedness to be able to ensure that others achieve prosperity, sustainable prosperity, and you and live in peace with the environment. Whoever tries to drive that agenda, either as a project, either as a, is said to us in my own organization, a youth. However, the world or academically, youth are you know defined chronologically uh, and are categorized in age you understand and it varies from one continent or the other so the un standard is any youth is a young person from zero <laughs> you know to 29 years un un zero to 29 years and uh, africa because we know in africa that our cultures vary before you can even graduate uh, in my own clan to say you are now a man <laughs> there's a number of years you have to get so because you are 18 years old, you cannot go to my own town hall meeting and start to sprue things. No, 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 no. So in Africa, that age limit has further been extended and it varies. But the consensus in the African Union is uh, 35. Uh, but in Nigeria, I know that we go as far as 40 because there's an adage that I grew to know that says that life truly, being a man or being a full adult, begins at 40 years is an adage in my own community. The point is this, that all the years in between zero and 40 are formative years that you are learning from the environment. And the community is the one teaching you. A child is owned by the community, not by your father and your mother. I'm talking about the African context. So on that note, they believe that 40 years of age is enough time for whoever, whether you are a you are a slow learner, you are a fast learner, you are whatever learner. It's enough time for you to transition, you know, into full adulthood, full responsibility. And it's even reflected in our laws on who, what age needs to be president or not. Although that has changed because young people like me, wonderful people like Laz, wonderful people, organization like Not Too Young to Run, have changed the narrative that now what we are defining as young or youth is the innovative concepts, the new ideas to addressing the challenges of our time. And young people seem to have that bastion of knowledge, or young people seem to have that vitality and that energy to push it forward. So I'll answer your question by saying uh, the definition for youthful engagement, either at the international level or the local level, is defined by this, an intentional partnership that any organization, any country, any, uh, any, any ward leader, any local government leader, any county, any chief, any dad, any mom must have that will, uh, that will actively involve 
young people doing the following things. I call it AID, A-I-D-A, doing the following things. One, uh, actively being involved in the agenda, A, ensuring that that agenda is implemented, I, D, ensuring that the decision making for the implementation is funneled through that, that uh, 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 biosympathetic, uh, bio, bio relationship. And then finally, as much as possible, ensuring that that project or the agenda between both of you are executed. So the intentional partnership between young people such that decision making, they are part of it, implementation, they are part of it, execution and evaluation, they are part of it, uh, 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 the agenda setting, the agenda setting before all this in their part of it defines uh, how to engage young people. So using that template for everything you do, even in your family, you want to make a decision in your family, you have to follow that stuff. Please, my son, whether he's 16 years old, 18 years old, now just talk to him. Uh, these are some, what do you think? Hear from him and then uh, uh, set up a consensus uh, agreement and then move on. So, so your question is up and this question needs to be domesticated at the local level. You know, because at the national level, we seem to have enough wonderful discussion. The United Nations Secretary General, thankfully, has involved a lot of us and are bringing more new boys into the CACOS. The uh, President of the General Assembly just sent an email to some of us uh, yesterday of that willingness to engage with us. So at the international level, it seems to be a more resonating thing. But at the local level, that's where the challenges Ah, that's where the challenges of governance, that's where the poverty is felt strongly. Poverty is not felt at the international level. We all know that poverty is felt at the local level. And that's why this uh, youth engagement, which I now call the general intergenerational engagement, you must engage youth because a 15-year-old has a mother and a father and you need consent, right? So you still have to have them involved in the decision-making, in the implementation, in the in the in the in the execution and also in ensuring that the agenda is set. So um, these thematic points are the foundation upon which youths are engaged, and these are the explanation that we should be giving to all our young people. I don't know if uh, any of the speakers have, but this to me is what I feel youthful engagement should mean, and what young people should know and take out to, that youthful engagement means. Of course, in addressing all the global issues, whether it's climate change, whether it's economic empowerment, whether it's achieving the sustainable development goal, it is still that same uh, abbreviation, A-I-D-E. You know, A being the agenda setting, you know, I being the implementation, uh, D being the decision making for reaching this implementation, and E being the execution or the evaluation of all the decisions and all the implementations that we, you know, to see that it's more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel, for this uh, detailed um, explanation. Uh, I, I would like to read out a message from Antonio um, Guterres, the Secretary General um, of the United Nations. He's calling on, um, okay, let me read it, let me quote him. He said, I call on leaders and adults everywhere to do everything possible to enable the world's youth to enjoy lives of safety, dignity, and opportunity, and contribute to the fullest of their great potential. From Anthony Gutter. So um, this is his call on leaders and adults. And we know that the International Youth Day is not just, uh, it's not just for the young people, because the youth of today is no longer people who are you know, below certain age range. The youth of today includes those who are young and also those who are young at heart and those who are very old, but, you know, they are committed to helping the young people, you know, grow and make progress in life. So my question here is, how can the adults in the world help the youth, you know, achieve this great potential of theirs? that uh, Antonio is calling for. I am asking this question to um, Jasmine. Jasmine, please, please tell us how um, the adults of today can help the, the youth you know, achieve their great potential. 
Thank you. Thank you, John Bosco, for the question and whoever asked the question. So um, I think that in my personal opinion, uh, that the best way that the adults can help the youth is by listening to them, uh, by providing them the resources, of course, to grow and to achieve what they want to, but also to come into a conversation with them. A lot of time, what I faced in my community, I don't know how it is. I mean, I see the same thing pretty much in U.S. too, but more in my community that, oh, you're young, so you don't know what you're talking about. That's not true. That's not true. Maybe I know something more about, I know I know more about climate change than the people, uh, the adult people in my community does. It has nothing to do with my age. It has what, what my intentions are, how much I want to learn, how much I have put the effort in, like what experience I have gained, right? So don't dismiss people just because they're young. Uh, don't dismiss people just because they're naive. Don't, get, don't take away opportunity from, don't deprive them of opportunities just because you think, you think that they're not capable of. Your thinking does not change uh, if a person is capable or not. The person's thinking change if the person is capable or not. Right. The only it, it said that the only limits that the that uh, we have are the ones we put in our minds. Right. That we, we put in our thinking, own thinking. So it's up to me. Right. If, if I'm capable or not, that's up to me. I how I think, how I uh, carry myself, how I, uh, you know, channel throughout the day. Do I do I spend the time learning? Do I spend the time to, you know, organize my stuff to actually look for uh solutions to problems right so i would say that uh to engage with the youth is the key uh thing that the adults can do today and to sit down in a conversation with them and a lot of times you know um some maybe some some adults don't understand technology some adults don't understand uh a lot of, a lot of the things that are going on in our generation that they do not understand so sit down with that person and ask them how is it going like how does that work uh can you please tell us that whatever we are doing is it helping your generation for example the education system is such a scam right now right like, the students don't have money and then they take take out loan and they keep studying and then they don't have job and then they do get a job but end up paying the loan for the rest of their lives what a scam do you sit down with these people and ask them that is the system working for them is it a viable system so i think uh the key the the best way to answer is that uh you know the adults need to sit down with the youth and have that conversation yeah, I hope that answers your question, John Bosco. Thank you. John Bosco, can I can I add one more point there? That, that was a great answer, Jasmine. Yes, but, uh, I, yes, I, I love the word from Dr. Daniel that, that said, you know, that there's an intentional partnership as part of the definition of engagement. And like you, you said, John Bosco, you know, many, many um, people who are outside that traditional definition, even the extended definition of youth, um, have a lot to bring to the table, but there has to be an intention to be willing to engage and to, to be part of the, the uh, sharing of experience, uh, both uh, perspective and, and experience that has come from the years in, in life, in the workplace, in solving problems, in managing issues, in managing companies, in managing processes. So, uh, you know, there, there's probably some work that could be done to engage adults to be more involved in training and uh, and taking an active part in ensuring that the youth, as as they come up through the through life, have the skills. So that's a, just another another piece. Thank you, uh, Pete, for that um, addition. The, you know, this year's uh, International Youth Day, the theme is Youth Engagement for Global Action. And the, the theme of International Youth Day, Youth Engagement for Global Action, it seeks to highlight the ways in which the engagement of young people at the local, national, and global levels, you know, how it's enriching national multilateral institutions and processes as well as it's, it's aimed to draw lessons on how their representation and engagement in formal institutional politics, you know, can be significantly enhanced. So here, um, multilateral institutions are also in the picture of what we are looking at 
uh, you know, a lot of people are giving up, especially the youth, because after spending years in the university and then you have your certificate, you go around, there's no job. You see some of them, you know, meddling into some, you know, some very bad activities just in a bit to get money, okay? So how can we, you know, involve the, the multilateral institutions, education centers, and all these various sectors where the human mind is shaped? How can we involve them in this campaign for youth development? Um, I, would like, um, I would like Joseph to help us Sorry, I would like uh, uh, Gail to, you know, help us, uh, you know, throw more light on how these institutions can help. Because as corporate bodies, they know, you know, they know one or two things. They have some resources. There's a way they can help. Please, Gail, help us, um, you know, direct this. Can you, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, John Bosco. John Bosco? Yes, yeah, so what he was saying, Gil, can you hear me? I can hear you. So John Bosco is asking, in light of the fact that um, the intentional partnership between youths and uh, stakeholders are important, one other thing that often gives the young man or the youth some problem is engaging multilateral corporations. Uh, in your own experience, what ways or how can this young man who has left university or who seems to be hopeless, how can he engage this multilateral organization to bring forward, you know, that, um, that agenda of creating sustainable? <clears throat> and then please, just, uh, please, uh, John Bosco, uh, let Elder Joseph uh, make some intervention and then Ambassador Sylvester follow after suit and then Francis say something and then any other person, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Gil. Okay. Um, I can only speak to um, our experiences here in the Bahamas and um, yes, I've been very lucky in that um, I've been able to see some youth, youths, young people making a way for themselves. Um, in January of last year, our government uh, enacted and facilitated a 14-week beekeeping class and it was only open to uh, I think 18 to 35 year olds and so that group of people they spent 14 days eight hours a day Monday through Friday they got a small stipend and then they were taught by people from universities from from away and then we had local people um, they were taught all sorts of things. They were taught how to, how to uh, create a cooperative. So uh, they were taught how to do, the, do everything to do with beehives and the health of the bees and how you market your honey, um, all of those things. And, and I've, I've been able to watch those youth actually come together and they've created their own cooperative. They've been assisted by government. We have a, a cooperative department of the Ministry of Agriculture, and now they're being assisted trying to get funding in order for each of them to get their own beehive company going. And some of them are going towards making products for cosmetics. Some of them are going towards making honey for sale. Uh, some of them are looking towards international marketing. And um, so, in seeing and in being able to watch that happen, it's very gratifying to see that the youth are, are taking advantage of the programs that our government is trying to offer because we, our government is able to get uh, funding from, from places like the UN and, and international funding from uh, the development banks and the inter-American development banks and uh, even the International Monetary Fund and also uh, the Global Environment Facility. So in trying to uh, empower the youth to go ahead and grab and, and try and get as much of this funding so that they can make their own businesses, so that they can 
become self-sufficient so they, they can make our country a sustainable country rather than something that's just buying fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels so it makes us our islands sink from sea level rise. You know, they're trying to do sustainable agriculture. And um, I think that's what I was trying to say in my, at the end of my speech was to, to try to empower the youth to look for those avenues Try to get the international funding, or, or even if there's funding within your own country, just try to get as much as you can so that you can, can empower yourselves and empower your friends and empower the other youth so that you make the Bahamas and uh, whatever country you're in a better country to live in and so that it's more sustainable and a healthy place and, and a thriving place so that you'll want to raise your family there. You want to stay there. You know, it's not going to be a place you want to run away from as a climate change refugee. So um, it's, it's, it's really up to the youth to check into the advantages. All you have to do is go and Google and, and, and type in granting opportunities. All sorts of things will pop up. And, and if you pursue them, if you don't know how to write a grant, find out someone who can teach you how. It's uh, it's really up to you with, with the internet and um, computers and everything. There's virtually nothing you can't do. Yeah, thank you so much. And you're right. Um, Elder Joseph, over to you. Uh, just give us in a few minutes your contribution or your intervention and, and focus more on um, your experience as an elderly person and where you see us going in the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's me, Joseph, who's speaking. Yes, yes, you, sir. Joseph okay, Davis. Okay, thank you very much. Well, congratulations to everyone, in particular, my colleague, Gail. You know, I worked with her for many years in the environment. So uh, she was mm -hmm. the one I actually started out with, with, with uh, Save the Bays to educational program for young people in the Bahamas. Uh, very succinctly, uh, let me say to you that 90% or more of young people in the Bahamas and this is probably propagated throughout the third world, 90% uh, of young people between the age of 18 and, and 25 or 30 do not own any part of their country. They, right. are totally, That's they are totally reliant upon extended family or they rent, they own nothing. And this is reprehensible, particularly in a place like the Bahamas, where we own an, a plethora or for what we call crown land, which actually is the Queen's land. Uh, but over the years, it's all been taken up by the oligarchy of the country, the most uh, precious parts of the country. And the poor people are left with what is basically at sea level, which we're going to lose another 80% of that in the next 35 or 40 years. And so what I would like to impress upon the United Nation is to impress upon all of the nations to make sure that the young people own something in their country. We have enough what we call crown land, which is distributed by whatever uh, government is in power. We have enough to give every single Bahamian man or woman at the age of 18, at least one acre of crown land, at least 25 to 30 feet above sea level, so that come, come climate change, sea level rise, which we experienced uh, dramatically here, as Gail pointed out, that we will be able to survive in the future. We need, we need to, for, for the major countries of the world who have created this uh, dismal situation for third world countries to make sure that they put out uh, the necessary funding to do this and to put it in the hands of NGOs, not governments, because government wow. somehow the monies disappear. We have, we have critical uh, sensible, wise NGOs in the country like the Bahamas, I'm sure throughout, who can probably uh, organize this money, even working along with the partnership with the government to make sure that it's distributed for the young people. We have nothing to, to pass on to them. 90, 99% of the wealth of this country, our Bahamas, uh, is owned by less than 1% of the population. And that is owned by uh, mostly uh, the uh, oligarchy who first uh, achieved all of their riches on the backs of poor whites and black people. And now the black people and the poor whites, they are suffering. We have 30% who are li living up below poverty level. 
So these are the things that I think internationally it should be known about our countries. And because we have what the GDP is, 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 a, is a mistake, they calculate that the Bahamas do not need help because we make too much money. But yet we have 39%. We, we probably make that money, but it's in, it's in banks abroad. It's in our, our national bank. It's a over $5 billion dollars that have been earned on the backs of poor people. And this has to stop, has to stop. And particularly with respect to climate change and the, the dramatic hurricanes that are coming, like we had with Dorian and now with COVID-19, God only knows what will happen. Let me just put this uh, again. Uh, we have 6,000 young people who are leaving high school this year. And because of COVID-19, they cannot travel abroad to go to universities. And so what's going to happen to all these young people? We are setting them up to be pariahs on society. And we've got to get over this foolishness. We've got to dictate that if any money is being governed by the uh, IMO or any institution abroad to a country, they must dictate that so much... of that programs and to make sure that the youth of the country has ownership in this country and other countries yeah, around thank the world. you so much thank you so much elder joseph and i've taken note of some of the things you've said because uh, it's also part of what we're going to discuss with the un and you've raised a very important important thing generational transfer of wealth it doesn't make sense that uh, the last 70 years uh, young people in the last 70 years lived better life than uh, young people currently here, just because they are not empowered, just because they, 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 they were not uh, adequately planned for, because intentionally transferring wealth to a generation is planned. <laughs> you don't just say, I just want to give. It's different from you, inheritance. It's different from inheritance. And I love the way you are going about it, that we should make it a national mandate on the global level space that every national election leader, any person that is leading, show us the plan of how you intend to transfer wealth to some percentage of people, and then hope that those percentage of people sustain that mantra across board. Why will encourage parents uh, and wealthy people to also continue to give their inheritance to their young people, advising them on proper investment in moving forward? I think this is a discussion that the UN needs to hear from you. And these are why the wisdoms of the elders are very important. I don't know why I've never thought of it. I've heard of uh, the concept of uh, wealth transfer in Africa. Yes, they've been saying it in Zimbabwe. They've been saying it in Zambia. But the way you have ironed it out is very simple. There should be a national policy and there should be an intentional policy that agencies now need to follow across board to transfer wealth either in form of land, in form of cash, like Gail has said, incentive giving, incentive giving to people to, start, to, uh, to understudy a B uh, a startup project. Those are ways to transfer wealth. Wealth is not just monetization. Knowledge skills are also part of the things to empower people, especially when you prepare them for the job of the future. You know, I totally agree with you. And uh, then I want uh, Ms. Francis to, uh, uh, to, to make our intervention in two minutes. And then we, we have a question for Peace Light and we want Ambassador Sylvester to be preparing afterward. Then we will round up with our senior lecturer, uh, uh, Dr. Michael, to uh, give us the next round of questions that I have for him. Over to you, Ms. Francis. Yeah, I'm sorry, my network has been, you know, acting up. Um, so um, to contribute to what, you know, everyone has been saying, I would like to say um, we need a platform to create a platform of platforms that actually work or that are proactive, you know, where young talents can be harnessed, mentored and encouraged. You know, I believe this will help give young graduates, you know, um, hope promote peace, and also point them in the right direction. And also point them in the right direction. Because the truth is that the, the young people in developing countries, um, especially countries like Nigeria, where I come from, have lost trust and hope in the system. Yeah. They, in fact, believe that there is no system in the first place. No so to win this trust back, 
I believe one of the things that can be done is um, for the government or let me say the stakeholders to partner more and also create room for organizations, NGOs, especially those that are run by younger people, by the youth, to come in and partner with and, you know, and interact with these young people because they are young people, they understand each other better. They will know, you know, what angle to come in. They will understand what the problems or issues are. Why? Because they're of the same generation. So if the government can create this platform where they can come in, interact with the young people, you know, understand them, and then prov provide solutions, you know, sustainable solutions that, that actually work. It's not just to talk and talk and talk. No. The younger generation, we want to come in, we want to work, you know, I mean, as a mother, you know, I, I see my children, what am I going to leave for them tomorrow? I know what I'm going through now with what is happening in the, uh, you know, country and all that, and, you know, internationally. We don't want our children to experience what we've experienced. So they need to create that platform. They need to allow us to be heard. They need to listen you know, to, to our needs and let us come in and handle these things ourselves. You know, it's, it's, it shouldn't be business as usual anymore where the old people will stick there. They don't want to, you know, give room. You know, I, I had an experience where one of them actually said that the younger generation don't care. No, we care. We do care about what is going on, you know, but giving us that chance to come in and do what, what we need to do, what needs to be done, what they have failed to do, you know, is going to be, uh, you know, a positive step towards achieving, you know, peace and prosperity, you know, creating jobs, you know, bringing back the lost hope, you know, to ensure that these young people are happy again, because without peace, like um, Dr. Daniel mentioned earlier, without peace, you know, we're going to just be creating or paving way for catastrophe to come in. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Ms. Francis, for really, really uh, uh, um, creating a different perspective that I also share with you. And her perspective is very important and is also in keeping with what um, Elder Joseph has said. See, the talking is too much. <laughs> we already know where the problems are. Uh, the challenge we have now is that national leaders must create hubs or platforms by hubs. What she's saying is that there are smart people that are very innovative. Cluster them up in one place and tell them your priorities. Okay, all of you here, we want new, uh, new classroom. We want new digital platforms for our educational store. We want a new airport. We want new planes. We want new cars. You know, create this hub and fund or incentivize, uh, give incentives to those funds and work with people that are sincere, representatives of the people that are sincere, uh, not giving to your cronies, not uh, having a contract signed at the back door and then indebtedness later. I totally agree with Francis. And these are some of the, uh, the reasons why we need to have this discussion, not only on this our scale. I know many people are, are sending questions on Facebook, uh, you know, for Francis. Um, uh, let me just tell you one of the things Francis, they say, please, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a young girl and I'm 21 years old. I left the university in, in, in 2016. And what, what uh, Ms. Francis is saying is very important, that they are not giving us even platform. You need to know people for you to even get anywhere. And sometimes it requires even uh, more than just greeting them. Sometimes your body will be on the line. So I agree with what uh, Francis is saying, that government now must again intentionally create hubs. These hubs now need to be backed by law, these hubs need to be funded in the budget. These uh, 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 hubs of young, smart people who are addressing thousands of other issues, who are working with also CSOs, need to be on that hub space. Now, conditions and criteria will be given to them for them to move forward. I want Ambassador Sylvester to make his intervention in two or three minutes while I ask. While I ask. Uh, 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 peace light to stand by for some questions on how do they contact you and why do you think peace education should be on the curriculum for African uh, people. Ambassador Sylvester, over to you, sir. 
Okay. So, uh, like I said, uh, thanks ever so much, Dr. Daniel. Uh, let me say uh, greetings from Liberia, uh, specifically from the um, members of Peace Campaign Liberia, uh, Mr. That, uh, Director John Bosco. Thank you so much, and let me say thanks to everyone. Okay, um, I listened to all the speakers, and then uh, they actually said it well. Uh, but I just want to say something to all of us as youth globally. You know, uh, I want to speak from this perspective of uh, from African leaders or African politicians. But before I do that, let me quickly quote um, that uh, Miles Maru, the late. He was one of the professional and recognized Venture International Motivational Speakers for Bahamas. You know, uh, one of the, in one of the audios, he said, if you, if you want to be successful in life, don't fight for success, but make sure you be valuable. In other words, make yourself value, and then people respect you. So now, uh, from what I actually grabbed from the late uh, motivational speaker, if you look in the continent of Africa, and perhaps in other continents, Especially in Africa, most of us, the youth, they don't value themselves. I listen to speakers saying the government, the government, the government. We make the government. If you look at, if you look in Africa, our leaders, about 60% of the youth put them in charge. So in this case, when the youth recognize their importance, when the youth recognize who they are, and they know that yes, indeed, they have ability. They have skills in them. And those skills that they have in them, they're being denied for those that they put in charge to afford them opportunities. They have to come to their senses. That is, they, they should value themselves. One of the things I was saying in Africa is that you will realize that many of the youth, they put leaders in offices or in power because of peanut because of what they can have for today, but they don't value that tomorrow. That's actually happens in most countries in Africa, and that is wrong. That is why people who are expected to make good policy on behalf of youth and also the countries, they are not making good policies. For example, uh, you realize that a politician will come in your community to give uh, you know, good talks to youth that when I get there, I will do this, I will do that. And you realize that a youth will be fighting for that leader to get in power or get in that office. After a few months, you realize that that leader will fail. So now, why can't youth come to their senses and see how best to me recognize that importance? How can they recognize that importance? One, we have been putting in power our leaders who have failed over time. I'm speaking from the specific of Africa. So we have learned a lot of lessons. I think it's about time we deny people that lies to all, all of the time by putting them in power. It's about time we surely accept, again, okay? it's about time we surely accept, you know, peanut money. That is, someone just gave you money for, you know, today's benefit of, of today's bread food. No. We should make sure to value our future. Before putting a leader into office or into power, that like leader be able to come to the youth that there is the infrastructure for vocational training or for the um, school that I'm preparing for this for, for youth. Or there is a scholarship that I have for the youth. I'm making sure that youth go in or on the scholarship as the leader value for that position before putting them in power. But we realize that he... Nowadays, most of the youth they allow leaders to use them. But most of the leaders they use the youth to get what they want, and at the end, they trash them. I think it's about time, specifically for in Africa, we come to our senses, recognize our importance. If and only if, like a definition that I heard from Dr. Daniel and also Michael, that a good investment has to do with involvement, you know, uh, making decisions. 
go to now that word and heal yourself. Are we seeing, you know, participating in national policy making or in national decision making? There are very few. How many youth are we seeing, you know, working in government or have been afforded the opportunity to work in government? Very few. But you realize that they were blending youth. So, yeah. in this light, I think it's about time as youth come to our senses, we recognize our importance before putting in our leaders in office, we we'll make sure that our leader, you know, exhibit this our achievement and making sure to get opportunities. I'm not just talking about worries, opportunity, but tangible opportunities that will make sure that youth can stay on in order to benefit tomorrow and contribute to the growth and development for every community uh, in your country or in your continent. But yes, Manasta, thank you so much, Ambassador Sylvester. Thank you so much. Yes, sorry, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sylvester from Liberia. And I must really appreciate you. I like how you are speaking truth to power. You're also aware that I have a direct link with uh, your government in Liberia, specifically the Ministry of Youth. Uh, mm. And you're aware that I know directly um, a junior minister, Ambassador, Ambassador um, Junior Minister um, Johnson, uh, Johnson mm. Moba, and then uh, the current Minister for Youth. And I know that they are doing uh, their own little bit, but I agree with you that it's not just... Um, it's not just uh, about the government, that the youth themselves must know their value in place. And one of the sure. ways to know their value is for government to ensure that there are youth capacity building programs sure. you know, so that yeah. they can increase their competence. Don't forget, this thing is about being articulate, being able to say, this is my problem, this is my challenge. Yeah. You'd be surprised, some of the protests you see is because they don't know how to voice yeah. They don't know how to write grants. They don't know how to write petition. They don't know what the process and step is. So we need to build some youths that will have that competency. Some youth that will have the confidence to speak truth to power. Some youth that will sure. be caring and compassionate for others. Some youth that will be very innovative. So I agree with you that youth first must at least value yourself first and then start to organize yourself together, you know, to now have a universal purpose, you know. Thank you so much. And I'm promising you that I intend You know, to work with you. And I think this is a wonderful way. I think what I'm hearing from you is a solid understanding that, uh, that I share ge uh, generally, and I will voice any day, you know, to any government. So thank you for that. And please keep in touch with me and John Bosco so that we can move forward. The next question is is for a uh, peace light. Uh, sorry, uh, Pete, Pete, there's a question for you. Please ask Pete that what happens when all peaceful negotiation fails? In the event that these negotiations do not go forward to create peace, what can people do? That's the situation we are having in many of the African countries, like in Congo. Uh, this is Dama. So Dama in Congo, let me put the question to you. Dama is saying this, that he believes in what you are saying about peace as the framework and the foundation upon which every other thing is gained. He understands really well that people need to internalize, people need to slow down and reset. In the bit that everybody has done this, and yet the aggressor still continues, or you still continue to see these conflicts in place. Uh, is there any other thing outside all you said that can be done, or what do you think in your own experience should uh, a young African who is, you know, facing a dictator, facing what should we do, or what should the international organization do, or what can your organization do? Uh, go ahead. While uh, uh, Dr. Michael prepares for um, the next question, and then Ms. Francis uh, concludes the section, and then Jasmine summarize uh, for us. Go ahead. Dama, th thank you for, for the question. Uh, it's very similar to a question I got a few weeks ago from a Nigerian group who were talking about some of the uh, cultural, ethnic, and religious violence up in northern Nigeria. And it's a tough situation, but the most important thing is you cannot give up, okay? There, there, there is no giving up because there is no alternative, okay? So one of the tools that always comes into, uh, into play in these sorts of situations is 
adjusting the ident identification of the parties. So if there are conflicts, there are certainly different levels of personal identification. And it comes down to a lot of times self-awareness uh, that, you, you know, one group identifies as a particular religion and another group as another religion or an ethnicity or a tribe or whatever it might be. But the importance of individually having these people who are in conflict identify as a human and identify as a Congolese, identify as an African becomes paramount. Now, you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing to, to get into those organizations sometimes and, and shift because you're not welcome because there's power in the identity of a religion. There's power in the identity of an ethnicity, but that cannot be stopped. Those attempts cannot be stopped. And it has to be done peacefully, but aggressively peacefully. Now, I believe personally that education is a key part of this. I mean, these problems go back to 1884, the Berlin Conference. They were put in place specifically to make it hard for you to do what you're trying to do right now. And that has to be recognized. And the way that is going to be Africa's renaissance out of these situations is going to be when the children grow up with the skills and the education and the awareness of not only that fact, but the skills to be able to negotiate and to, to just see that there are, are ways around issues. And, and especially with what's coming down the road for you all as youth, uh, you know, the, the environment's not gonna get any better in the short term here. You know, there's gonna be more migration as we're hearing a lot of, uh, you know, sea levels rise. And those issues are gonna become more and more forefront. But the more that there could be a standardized understanding inculcated into African society, and it's called for in Agenda 2063, a culture of peace and tolerance shall be nurtured in Africa's children and youth through peace education. There is no efforts to formalize the curriculum across 55 nations right now. So that's where I see the organization Project Peace Lights coming in to not do it. I mean, I'm a guy from New Jersey. I'm not, and this has to be done by Africans for Africa, but as they do with many boards around, um, around the world, often a, a pursuit because there's a fresh perspective. There's an ability to cut through a lot of the uh, inherent um, thinking and, and challenges that, that have come. And I look at myself as a facilitator and all I am doing is trying to help facilitate the acceleration of the timeline where peace education curriculum can be developed, defined, developed, and then rolled out in the whole country. So uh, I, I wish you all the best, uh, Dama. And you know, it's a challenge. One of the things that you should know, it is not just a challenge in Congo. So I, I would uh, ask you and, and uh, suggest to you that there are others who could also provide insight. So don't give up, look for those avenues and, and keep the focus on educating not only yourselves with the skills that you'll need to uh, address these issues, but also get that education starting right from the youngest of ages. Thank yes, you. thank you so much, Pete, for conceptualizing that question. And I love something about you. You always see it as it is. You know, it's a tough question and it's a tough discussion because what is happening in Congo is happening to some lesser degree in Nigeria, in uh, Mali, in uh, Zimbabwe, in some parts of South Africa, in Ethiopia, in Egypt, you know, it is true. And I like the way you summarized it. You start with this. Try at least to start off with peace. Try and see whether you can get into the system. Try and see whether you can befriend your aggressor. Because that's what you're saying. Try and incorporate yourself into the system. If that doesn't work, try and see whether you can work with other people to educate them on the need to see reason for peace. Because whether we like it or not, education will still be key. But more importantly, emotionally, never give up when you see hurdles before you that are great. And I want to give a testimony to what you've just said. Um, in 2019, June to be precise, the UN Office of Out of Space Affairs, they are the agency in the UN responsible for anything in space, 
any projection in space or any launch in space, you have to submit. <laughs> you have to submit a report or a data with them. They track them. So they wanted to bring in sustainable development goals in their agenda. Then they did a competition and they asked that they want young people to be able to tell them how space-based technology or space-based policies can drive and achieve sustainable development goals. Now, I happen to be in the area of uh, SDG 13, you know, and I said to myself, I just finished my fellowship at the Cornell University, and they had impacted on us very wonderful strategies, policies that, are, that academic people use in uh, changing minds. And then I did some research work, and I found out that we could actually use space-based technology to drive and monitor what's happened on land and to give farmers in Africa or in vulnerable communities heads up on when the rain will come, amount of rain to expect, amount of heat, types of crop to do. Because satellite-based technology is not, res is not uh, affected by atmospheric variables. You do know there are no rain, <laughs> you know. You do know there are no hurricane in space, you know. But land-based technology can fail when there are flooding, just like in Bahamas. Once there is flooding, all the power lights are off. Te technology becomes difficult. So I felt, why not use that space? And I and my team of three young, wonderful girls, my wife inclusive, and somebody in Europe, we designed the concept. I presented it to them. And then the US, the US department, uh, uh, my, uh, Pompey, and then the um, International Astronautical Federation sent me an email, young man, who are you? I, I said, uh, I'm just a uh, medical personnel. I run a non for profit. Say, ah, you are not even a space based person. I said, yes. What did you do differently? I said, I studied. Education is key. Education opens you the door. And when you think out of the box, you'll be able to create stuff. We were actually sponsored to Washington, D.C., where I met Mike Pence. I went to the White House. You know, it was also. Uh, it was also uh, connected to the 50th year landing of Armstrong, you know, that 2019 was 50 years that US had entered into space. I met with the NASA director, and currently we are working with um, a department of NASA to develop this concept. My point is this, to our viewers listening to Facebook, I'm an African, I know nothing about space. Yes, I am science inclined. Yes, I read very well. Yes, I'm a scholar. Yes, I run an organization, but I still needed to think out of the box. I needed to use innovative thinking to address local issues in my area. I know that in Africa, if they're able to predict how weather patterns are taking place, they'll be able to plan farming system better. If they're able to know the intensity of temp temperature for the day, you'll be able to advise people to stay away from you know, exposure to sunlight. If you're able to know uh, 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 where animals are having stress from satellite guided image, you'll be able to, if you're able to have a climate Wikipedia-like app, an app that can tell you, you know, information in real time to be key. And, and I never gave up, you know, I was able to enter the UN space, you know, reach out to two people, share my ideas with them. And somebody just said, young man, I love what we, you're doing. And we won. And we were sponsored to Washington. You know, we were given some grants and all those stuff. And, and, and I was even invited to the UN General Assembly. So I am supporting what you are saying, that to the, Congre to the Congo uh, lady, please do not give up. You must try and see whether you can still break in into your aggressors. You must get education and look for where uh, the major challenge is. You must try to see how you can... Uh, uh, creates homegrown solutions to some problems. And then uh, more importantly, you must ensure as much as possible that you never give up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pete. Um, Dr. Michael, I have a question for you. Uh, then I'll uh, allow uh, J uh, 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 Jasmine to say. But before then, John Bosco, you have a question that has been waiting, but because you were offline and you are back on. Uh, please ask John Bosco this. My name is Edafe, I mean, uh, northern part of Nigeria. Um, how can we ensure that peace campaign, your organization that you are doing, will reach out to those of us in the northern, uh, northern space? And I think what he's trying to say is that he's a Nigerian, that he's currently staying in the north, and uh, maybe there are some issues or conflicts currently going on. 
how can your organization, Peace Campaign, be able to help them uh, in the north spread the, the message of peace, sustainable development? Over to you, uh, sir, John Bosco. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. Um, this question is a very important question because Nigeria is undergoing a lot of um, changes right now. Changes in the sense that people are becoming more aware and uh, you know, things are not you know, in sync between the citizens and the government. So a lot of people are you know, being more aggressive and the security situation is getting worse. So about uh, what we can do you know, to help the situation, uh, I will start by reminding us that, especially for this pandemic period, people have come to learn that it's no longer, it is no longer the government government thing. It's also now time for individuals to you know, go individually, collectively, as organizations, you know, you know, to, to put things in order, no longer waiting for the government. So this um, organization, Peace Campaign Nigeria, what we are doing is trying to bring people together, especially the youth. And by the youth, we are not uh, looking at those who are, you know, categorized by age. We are looking at those who are willing to make Nigeria a better place. So we are trying to bring people together, and that includes you in the north, those in the west, south, and those in the east, we come together, not going for you know um, a revolution, you know something that is violent, but we will come together. We share ideas on how we can be innovative. By innovation, we can uh, get to do uh, things that will help us individually and keep us busy, because one of the one of the causes of unrest. One of the causes of um, you know, security, all these security challenges is people do not have this self-sufficiency. Self people are always in lack. And when someone in lack, is in lack, what do you expect the person to do? The person goes out of his way to do whatever he can. And at some point, the person loses all moral values. You know, he's, he's trying to get it at all costs. So when someone is going out of the norm to get something at all costs, there is a security problem. So we can de uh, de decide among ourselves to begin to change our mindset as youth. And that is why this organization has come to stay. So we can help you, you know, put you on track on how you can be self-sufficient, how you can acquire some necessary, necessary skills that can help you survive this change that places like Nigeria is going through now. Okay, um, there's a program. Um, I, I, I had an opportunity to join with uh, the Miss Earth New York a few weeks back, a program on recycling and upcycling. You see, this program is not rocket science, it's just about how to take what's around you and convert it to something else that is meaningful. But you see, from that program, I got to learn that the major challenges of us, especially the youth, is looking for things where they are not. You understand? So from that upcycling, which I would introduce to the larger populace of Nigeria, it's a, it's a bright idea. I learned that while you are looking for those things that are in marbles, you can also get clay and turn it to your own marble. And when that marble becomes so beautiful, you will see people leaving the regular marble and coming to join you in the, in the, in the clay mold. Okay? Then as well, I want to encourage you and every other youth that is listening. This is a time of connecting and reconnecting. The world has offered us a very powerful platform, the internet. So if you are not connecting these days, you are missing out on a lot of things because that thing you've been thinking about, you've been worried about how you can achieve it. By some small connections, you might meet the right person that will put you on track, that will sponsor the project, okay? But I can just, you know, you know, take you to your destiny land. And by doing some researches, I believe Nigerian youth will leave all these political uh, affiliations in Nigeria is very bad because politicians during the election, they hired the youth 
as talks. Okay? And after the election, they dump the youth. And when you've given a young boy an arm, you know, to fight for you, to help you grab power, and then you get into power and you abandon this young boy, what do you expect him to do? He still has the arms in his hand, right? He's going to use it oftentimes the wrong way because he's not a police officer. He's going to use it to kill, to steal, to terrorize people. And that's why we have a lot, lots of terrorism in Nigeria. So what we are doing as an organization is bringing people like you and I together, encouraging and educating and also informing ourselves so that we can stay away from all this uh, political uh, rigmaroling and then put us, our eyes on the brighter future. Because if you ask me, the past generation has a lot of apology for the current generation. But it makes no sense if we demand an apology and in the end we do not have something tangible to leave for the upcoming generation. Okay, so it, rather than seeking the apology right now, I think I have to go by the words of the Bible that said we should remove the big plank in our eyes before asking someone to remove the pieces of wood. So let us right our wrong, forget about all these social media, you know, funny things you see. People are just seeking for attention and they are doing it the wrong way. Leave all these celebrities, they have made their money, right? It's time for you to bring out one initiative, something that is innovative, something that will make you a celebrity too. So rather than keep celebrating other people, which is also good, you also get celebrated in turn. So I, I look forward to connecting with you. Um, you can send a message to our Facebook group. I would, uh, you know, get in touch with you so that you can join us. You can see what we are doing. And you also need to be an ambassador where you are because what you say may not have a lasting impression, but what you do, people see. Whether you are aware or not, what you do, people see them. And what they see, they will always remember. So thank you for this opportunity. And like I said, I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Don Bosco, for your wisdom. You know, I've had a lot of proverbs that I have not had for a very long time. And every word you said, you understand, resonates with me as, and I don't know for other people as an African, resonates with me, that, um, that the conflicts we are seeing in some of African countries are just sad and unfortunate. Uh, however, there is still hope for people and there are things that people need to do requiring us, uh, you know, and uh, following the basic, basic principles of peace. First, as much as possible, start to remove the peck, the speck in your own eyes, you know. Start to ensure that from time to time, you are not being used to do something wrong, you know. Speak up for the truth and, and, and thank you. And please, and, uh, uh, please, let's send the link for the organization Peace Campaign Nigeria or Peace Campaign International so that he can also get in touch. As we round up and we conclude, uh, I will uh, want um, uh, Ms. Francis says she has a two minutes intervention. Then I want um, Dr. Mike to follow suit after her. Then I want Jasmine to uh, give us um, some heads up on what Team 54 Project, which is one of the partnering organizations for this event, is doing. And then Gail will give her passing note and then. Uh, I will hand over to John Bosco to give the closing remark. Um, so, Ms. Francis, in two minutes, uh, make your concluding intervention uh, uh, for us. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Sorry, it's mute. You are mute, ma'am. It's mute. I, I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So um, I, I was saying, um, just to add a little bit to, you know, what we've been talking about, um, I would just want to mention a few things. Okay, so um, first of all, to the politicians, to the politicians, um, I would say, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So I would say, politicians, okay, you loot the money and then you put the money... And then you put the money, 
I'm so sorry about this. No problem. So, um, Today's international again, youth day. The the I was no problem. <laughs> just go ahead and you can do so that you can attend. Mine yeah, have so um, you loot the money and then you put the Okay, yeah, so you loot the money and then what do you do with the money? Instead of investing it and also which can help create job opportunities and um, or even a platform where these voices, these young voices can be heard and seen and, you know, harnessed. You know, you just don't go loot the money because at the end of the day you loot it and you put it away in a, in a room or somewhere and then you're not investing it and you're just spending it. It doesn't make sense at all. Why not invest it at least? Use it to jobs, which will, which will provide, um, which will promote peace, you know. And then also, you, you want these younger ones that get into, uh, you know, internet fraud and all that when they are caught. And the system, they end up blaming the government, the government. And then when you turn around and you look, you see that, yes, you know, they have, they, they're making sense. Even though that is not a reason for them to continue to do what they're doing. You know? And um, like um, the, the ambassador from Liberia was saying, the youth, they need to believe in themselves. Stop taking peanuts. It's not going to help anyway. Because the day you take those peanuts, you know, direction, and then two months down the road, what, what happens? You're back at square one. It doesn't help you. You need to believe, we need to believe in ourselves. Young people, all the dancing, enough of the dancing and, you know, all the... I don't yeah. know what to call it on social media. Yeah. It's not even sustainable. Yeah. Okay, you dance and dance and dance, and then what are you leaving for your child tomorrow? Nothing. Your child is going to come up tomorrow and you tell your child to go on dancing? It doesn't help. So we as young people need to get serious. It's high time we stop all of that and get serious. We shouldn't have any excuses anymore. And, you know, as part of seeing that this issue is, you know, mitigated, um, by Escape International, we're, we're planning on, you know, launching a platform, you know, soon where young talents can be harnessed. Yeah. So, well, doing that to encourage the youth, you have no excuse. There is absolutely no excuse. And also to encourage other people or organizations that are in um, a, a position to, you know, create such platforms. They can also, you know, go ahead and do the same. Because it, it, it is going to take all of us, a collective effort, to see that these things, you know, are stopped. To see that these issues yeah. are taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm asking that, you know, keep in touch, you know. We are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, so we're going to be launching our website. You know, just stay in touch at Bioscape International. That is um, our, our Instagram, Instagram handle. Instagram stay in touch so that when we... Yeah, so that when this platform is out there, you know, you can get involved, you know, you register, you get people you know to, you know, get to register as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for, for that, Ms. Francis. And I know that John Bosco is going to be very, very happy and he'll be taking you up on that. Please, John Bosco, see to it that you, you go to BioEscape. They are based in the U.S. and she's the brainchild behind and that. And she also focuses on women empowerment more, but more on, on intergeneration. I want to call on one of the Cornell University fellows, someone I respect so much from my own homeland. I, I speak other languages apart from my native language. So Egbomi, you know, Egbomi means he's my senior or my senior brother. From another Daniel. Brother. One thing that makes me respect Michael, Dr. Michael is this. He has a grasp of what the situation is and is always open to new ideas on how to make things better. So the question I want to put for, for him, from my own view as a Nigerian, is for you to, uh, where did we get it wrong in West Africa or in Nigeria? Where did we get it wrong? And in moving forward, what do you think we can do to be on the path? We may not get everything, but what can we do from your own experience? Over to you. Once he's done with it, Jasmine, uh, you'll be on standby. Gail will give her concluding remark. Jasmine's rounds up, and then we we'll hand over. Over to you, Doctor uh, Obe. Thank you so very much, uh, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel has been has been something else. <laughs> yeah. Where did we get it wrong? From my experience in West Africa, 
we got it wrong through the influence and intervention of the military. That's where we got it very, very wrong. But prior to that, we also got it wrong when our civilian leaders did not have the appropriate vision to move the nation forward. We had good money in our hands. We had wealth in our hands in the 70s, but there was no wisdom, there was no vision. That was the prior or the beginning of where we got it wrong. By the time the civilians had wealth without vision, the military came in to tell them that they were not wise. So the military took over. When the military took over, rather than applying the wisdom, they went haywire and Nigeria began to nose dive. I was privileged to experience that throughout my life. In the 70s, if I walked to Lagos Island, I wrote it in, in the book we, we, we authored, the fresh air that we experience in the morning after the night is it's a wow. But today is a different thing. The respect we have for our national anthem and pledge in those days was totally different. Totally different. My wife, who was in another community, I was a different community. By the time we met and we were sharing experience, she was telling me where she was, that where they were in a secondary school, far in Ikeja, there is always a boost, boost pimples. When she traveled to her state for high school, there was also a good pimples when the national anthem and the pledge was being read, not by high low, but by many of our colleagues, because it was, it was a hard commitment to your nation. The whole of your heart is to your nation. But today, when my children are singing national anthem, oh my goodness, it's a totally different ball game. Just to say it so that the teacher will say, okay, you can go to your class. There is no hard commitment. You understand? This is where we have gotten it wrong. So the children of today, some, children, some, some younger, young boys, I won't call them, they are men they are in their late 20s, sorry. They came to see my daughter in the house. And I saw the way they were dressed, and know that, you know, my daughter is in mass communication. And I said, Busola, at this year, I said, she gave me some signal because the way they were dressed, you know, she said, that they are customers. I understand what he was trying to say. So I, I spoke to one of them. So why are you to music? He said, Daddy, Daddy, this country has no vision for us. And he opened, I, I, I felt like weeping. And he was right. He was right. The truth is the vision that most leaders in Nigeria have for our youth is, I call it 19th century cosmetics. Just me, how will you feel if I buy you a cosmetics that was designed in 1900 as a gift for a birthday? How would you feel? It's not going to be ah, exactly. exactly. Just say, you, you, if you struggle to collect it with my hand, you want to keep it in, in, your, in your museum, in your house, and put my name on it, for your children to see the, what, what this old man brought. <laughs> That's what I have to say. <laughs> in the educational system, it's a, it's, a, it's a 19th century cosmetic. What they will tell us publicly, what they want to do, is always 19th century. So that's a major problem. That's why we're putting it wrong. How do we solve this problem? One of the things we should do is to put what I call peaceful pressure on our leaders. Peaceful pressure. Peaceful pressure. Peaceful pressure. Just like you tell me, Daddy, I'm not going to eat this food. It is poisonous. I say, if you don't eat it, I will kill you. Say, I'm sorry, Daddy. Please, Daddy, I'm not going to eat this food. Let's put peaceful pressure on our politicians. Number two, our religious leaders. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention those two points. Yeah. Daniel, you will recall that when we are doing our discussion in Cornell, we raised this matter. Yes. If we look at the population of Nigeria and West Africa generally, the religious leaders have a stronghold mm -hmm. in the thinking pattern of our people. That's true. A lot. And this salvation or deliverance or freedom or freedom from poverty, freedom from uh, illiteracy, 
begins in the mind. If the mind is not liberated, our youth will not think right. They will mm. think of buying a $50 jeans before buying a, a $5 book to read. Difference in value, misplace of value. So I want to suggest that if we can get through to our religious leaders in this country to help reorientate the minds of our youth to education, to training, acquiring knowledge, acquiring skills, for the 21st century, things will begin to change from the grassroots. That's where the pressure will begin. That's where the pressure will begin. Let me give you an instance. A friend to my daughter had a challenge with the bank. He transferred some money and they did not send the money to that person. He also went, used a POS machine to move money and nothing happened. And he went to the bank. They told him that, ah, don't worry, 24 hours will get it done. One day, two days, three days, one week has passed, nothing happened. You know what he did? He went on social media, straight to Twitter. And he began to explain what happened. And people were making contributions. I tell you, after about one hour, the Twitter was awash with the problem of that bank. And you know what that means for the bank? He said within one hour, they reversed the money. That's, that was pressure. Mm. But it was a peaceful pressure. Yeah. We can do the same with our religious leaders. Let our religious leaders begin to change the mind of our people and orientate, orientate their mind. I'm telling you, a lot of things will happen. Things will change. Even in the now, these children that we are saying they are poor, 20 years, 30 years, they are 30, 40, and they are there in their th hundreds of thousands. I served in Kano. I served in Kano. And I had food in my hand. And I turned back with my hand on the other side, and I was talking to somebody, and the food was gone. You eat, and you left your food on the table, and flies are all over your food. You say, oh, I can't eat this food. Before you come, people are packed it, and they are eating. And you, and you, can, you, you are almost weeping. Now, after 20 years, where, what is the fate of these children? They can be hired by any terrorist organization. And that's what we are having in the North today. One of our politicians in the 80s said, the youth in the north is a time bomb. And today they are exploding. I wonder what said so. We wanted, wanted to bring a, a new form of education. Now the bomb is exploding. The minds are blowing up. So our lead, religious leaders have been able to reorient the minds of these children. A lot of things will have been done. I think those are the things I want to share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wisdom and the strategy of using peaceful pressure for our leaders. I've not heard that concept before and is in keeping with our team today. I think these are kinds of leaders, people like you are what I think the UN should be listening to. Peaceful pressure is important in getting uh, things done. Then looking for local made solutions is global agenda, but the action will be done locally. And in Africa, like you said, religious people play a very important role in over 1.5 million lives. You understand. So we must also educate them so that that misplaced values, right. the value where a 23-year-old boy who doesn't have a house of himself is wearing a chain necklace that is 7 million, is buying a car of 27 million with no roads, no water, instead of studying and reading like those in China and Japan who are creating the jobs of the future. Okay. Yeah, and I agree with what Francis, uh, uh, Miss Francis is saying. The time for dancing for Africans. Maybe for Americans and for advanced nations, but for Africans, those times of dancing are all over. Because people in Asia are already studying hard. They already know your language. They know where your challenges are. They are not dancing. You understand? You are buying all their products, and they are watching you dance away your future. It doesn't make sense. Miss Francis is right. For Africans, any African that is hearing this, those eras of dancing are wrong. Don't get me wrong. For those that want to follow that passion and, and that uh, career, that's fine. But you have to get organized. You have to get better di digitalized. The content of what you are sending out must, you know, must be rooted on, on, um, on values like what Dr. Michael has said. So and for the rest of us that do not have that talent to, to dance, we should start thinking of how we will address education. We should start thinking of how we can convert textbooks into digital uh, platform. We should be thinking of how we can secure ourselves 
designing apps that can trace hoodlums that rape people, that molest people, that steal other people. You know, we should be thinking of other things. So thank you so much for that wisdom. Uh, Gail, um, can you make your last passing uh, conclusion while I, I hand over to Jasmine and who hands over to John Bosco? Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful anchoring this uh, other part. Uh, bye. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. As always, you always say a mouthful. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to um, tell two short stories uh, about when I was in my youth and when I thought I was fairly powerless. Um, I ended up getting uh, in my tw in my twenties. I came home and um, didn't have a job. I was I was wandering around and. Um, ended up babysitting for a friend who had just moved to Nassau and I ended up getting caught up in this thing called uh, long line fishing. It was, a, it was a, a controversy that was going on. The, the minister of fisheries was trying to push for us to get like 23 boats or something and um, the problem with those boats is one, one long line can be as long as 60 miles and they also will have like two teaser lines of four miles each and they have a hook every 10 feet. So they target sharks for the, the highly lucrative shark fin market. So uh, in looking at that, I realized it was not going to be sustainable. So I was recruited by uh, Sam Duncombe of ReEarth and we ended up forming a coalition of various environmental groups uh, Ocean Watch and the Bahamas National Trust and um, I can't even remember all the names but it was a big group uh, coalition and at one point during November a group of tourists came and this one particular boat that had been going around had, was actually bringing in the sharks and um, the tourists came to dive with the sharks but the sharks weren't there and then the videographer saw the boat in the distance and he actually went over to try to get video and he almost got caught in the line and almost got killed but that footage went on the the news and the tourists were angry and um so the people from ocean watch chris cates called me in freeport i was back home in freeport by then he said what can we do um we've been to the ministry of tourism nothing's working uh, they're not listening to us and now it's affecting tourism, not just fishing. So um, I did what I was told by uh, Pat Bain, the head of the Hotel and Allied Caterers Work Workers Union. And I tried to, I applied for a permit to demonstrate. So in, in uh, short, um, we ended up demonstrating for three days in front of our House of Assembly. And after the end of the three days, um, the, I was actually handcuffed to a guy and we had black armbands signifying the death of the ocean. And the prime minister came out and spoke to us and he said, uh, I'm inviting you to come in. We're going to waive the rules. You're not allowed to come in t-shirts because we all had t-shirts. Um, I want you to come in and it, witness me ban longline fishing in the country. So that's one thing it was very empowering to to be a part of that movement and to be heavily involved with it and it actually made me feel like okay youth can make a difference we can change things that are wrong we can make our voices heard so um that's just one story then um a little later i was asked to speak to a a, a, a civic group and um I was talking about cruise ships dumping and I had proof and pictures and I did a long speech about how we should up our fines for the penalties. And as I left the meeting, uh, after getting all sorts of uh, support from, you know, the people in the meeting, I was driving behind someone who was in the meeting and they threw Kentucky boxes, Kentucky fried chicken boxes out of their window of their car in front of me. And I, that was a turning point for me. I decided I'm not going to talk to adults anymore. I'm only going to concentrate on youth. I'm only going to concentrate on kids because I'm done. The adults are, I've given up on them. So um, 
that's my story as far as I think the youth are the answer. You, you have so much as, as potential and it's just, we're waiting to see what you're going to do with it because um, I, I have trust in you that you're going to do the right thing. You're going to find a path to peace and you're going to enhance our socioeconomic progress and we're depending on you. So please call us. If you need help from me, if you need help from Daniel, if you need help from anyone on the panel, just let us know. You can reach us through Facebook and through um, John Bosco. So we're here for you, but you got to take over the reins because I'm getting old. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for the wonderful um, advice. Dr. Daniel? Hello, yes. Dr. Daniel. Yeah. Yes. Is someone else yes, still taking you. questions? Yes. Um, um, the questions that we have here, we will reply them via email. I wanted uh, Jasmine to um, give her intervention uh, and then we hand over to you. Uh, there's one question I will ask, but let Jasmine finish. Uh, I will ask the question. The question is actually directed to, to Gil. The question is directed to Gil on, uh, but once she answers that question, then I'll hand over to you to take us out for the event. So Jasmine, over to you. My daughter says she's wishing also International uh, Day. So, and she's uh, eight years old. So I don't know whether she falls into. Uh, a very <laughs> happy International Day to your daughter as well, Daniel. So yeah, hi guys, I'm back. And uh, I just quickly wanted to say that uh, it has been an amazing uh, event so far. So much information. I got to learn so many stuff that I didn't even know about. So thanks to all of you that spoke. And what amazing questions are coming through the uh, you know internet. It's, it's just amazing how we can connect together. So um I just wanted to tell you what my vision uh, from here is for Team 54 Project International. Um, as the executive director of Team 54 Project International, my goal right now is to promote, uh, you know, home-based solutions because you know we cannot go out there right now given the current situations of the pandemic and i don't want to put people out there and you know uh just risk their lives or just spread of uh, the you know whatever is going on so just staying at home so we we kind of looked at what is going on how the lives of people are coming along so what we realized is that a lot of people are not having jobs right now and um given the economic crash that we currently have, we are predicting that this might go along a little farther than just this period. So how can we better prepare people for the time being or, or like for the uh, upcoming months or even year? We don't know where this is going, right? So we decided that, you know, Team 54 Project started with the 54 Nations of Africa. Of course, we are around the world right now, but we actually started with the 54 Nations of Africa. So we are cu currently focusing to start from there uh how we can have smart agriculture and what we call permaculture and um you know um have sustainable businesses like you know just something that you can grow in your backyard and then trade out there uh using solar energy cleaner energy so that you are more cost efficient and also there is not like there is zero waste coming out of whatever your activities are so just promoting those concepts uh educating the people the youth actually uh team 54 project is very closely working with the youth in all these nations uh, the 54 nations of africa and i must say they're very enthusiastic very energetic young people i have never seen that kind of energy coming from any other nation not even in my country and i'm being honest right now so i'm very excited to uh you know work with them closely and they have great ideas and one thing that team 54 project has always believed in is to listen with people while engaging the youth right um uh, for example uh, i'm speaking today and daniel is also speaking today we are both part of team 54 project he's the president and founder and i'm the executive director but will you believe it or not i don't know we did not coordinate before this event what i am going to speak about what daniel daniel never puts my words in my mouth i never go and tell daniel okay this is what i want you to speak this because we both want our ideas to come out 
And we know that when we have the same innate beliefs of helping people, uh, no matter what we say, it is always about the people. It's never going to be conflicting because it is about the people, right? It's about helping everyone around us. So uh, this is why, like, I, this is just an example that I just gave you that, you know, it's very important to listen to people, no matter how close they are to you, no matter if they're a stranger to you. Like, I could say that, okay, I don't need to know what uh, Daniel wants to speak because I know him closely. No, I didn't say that. I was intent listening to what he had to say and I'm sure he's doing the same for me right so it's, it's always uh, you know very important to listen to other people this is where you get the ideas and this is where you know what where to go from here right how will you know what problem you have if you don't even collect data from people right so it's very important to listen and one more uh, thing that I would say regarding our vision is that I have always believed that this is something Daniel knows I think we both uh, share the same uh, value is that we have never even though we closely work in the area of SDG 13, we have never confined ourselves to that. And we both strictly believe that, you know, if I want to address one SDG, any SDG you take from all the SDGs, you will see that they're all interrelated. You cannot solve the problem of one without solving the others, without addressing the others. So what I want, my vision for Team 54 Project is that it is never going to be only a climate-based you know, organization, even though that's our primary focus. We will always address uh, all the other SDGs, all the other things that we need to work on because we believe that we can never accomplish what we want to accomplish for uh, SDG 13 if we don't acknowledge the other ones uh, which is why you know we, we uh, and another, another thing is that like you know I just uh, before we started speaking I just briefly shared my journey of coming here uh, the challenges I faced uh, for being a woman and uh, forget about just women, also women of color, right? Coming from Bangladesh and my, my parents were, uh, you know, always very supportive and stuff, but, you know, they also were raised in that conservative situation in that conservative, uh, you know, environment. So they thought that, why does she need to go abroad to study? And, uh, you know, uh, my family said that, oh, she doesn't have to study after high school. Like some of them said primary school, but let's not get there. <laughs> I pushed through it and um, then I finished my high school and what I did was was that you know I did not tell my parents that I was applying to the United States because I knew if I did they would, it would be a no and because then my, my father said on my face that whatever you have to do within the country uh, don't think about anything else so the moment he said that the same moment the very same moment I told in my head I'm gonna do this I'm gonna find something and I'm gonna come and tell you that I did it and I'm going and I did exactly that right and today I'm here Okay, so uh, thank you. <laughs> so today I'm here and my goal is that if I am facing that, I'm sure many other women around the world are facing that. And I know that all of you have a lot of potential. You have good uh, intentions. You have good ideas, great ideas, actually, far better than I have. And I know that you can go far better than I can. Because I speak to some African girls while working at Team 54 Project. And there is this girl from Uganda, and she has um, uh, ideas for uh, sustainable sanitary pads. I have never heard that in my entire life. Where did she get that idea? She doesn't even have the resources to, to produce that on a larger scale. I'm working closely with her to help the, uh, that expand. But oh my God, where did she get that idea? But she has that idea and I'm working with her. And there is this other girl, um, I think she's in Somaliland, right? Uh, right? Uh, Daniel uh, Hapun? Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, and you know, in in her society, she she's a Muslim girl, and she she wears her job, and I'm also Muslim, by the way. So she wears her job, and uh, you know, when she wanted to advocate for the country, for for climate, and for the other SDGs, she was told that oh, you cannot do that, and she was threatened. And Daniel and I, we were actually pleading with her that don't risk your life save your life first we can do this later but she was determined and she was like no i'm going to do it i'm going to post my picture on social media and i'm going to tell people that i stand for this i want to empower these women i i so the point of telling all this to you is that i want to, my vision as the executive director for team 54 project international is that it is going to be a hub for all the people around the world, doesn't matter their color, doesn't matter their gender, their age, their ethnicity, their race, I don't care, their nationality, we are all human, that's all what I believe. And we are always going to listen to everyone, what they have to say, we're going to work closely with you and see what how we can provide the best for you and how we can uh, help you go forward. So if, if uh, 
any of you have any suggestions, any ideas, any anything that you want to speak to us about, please reach out uh, to our Facebook handle, uh, Team 54 Project International, uh, join our group or reach out to me on Facebook. I would be happy to talk to you. We have Daniel here. We have John Bosco here. You have you have various ways of just reaching out to us. Just make that first step and we'll make it work together. Okay? Thank you so, so much, you. Jasmine. You know, I can't, I couldn't have said it better. And, and let me tell you, let me tell our viewers, especially on social media, on Facebook, uh, the reason why we went this far is because of all what Jasmine has said and all inclusive stuff. You want to tell somebody to plant the trees. The lady you are telling to plant the tree has not eaten since morning. And you tell her not to cut wood that she needs to go and prepare. It will just look like Latin for her. She will see you as her enemy. But if you now tell her that you as a young man, as an engineer, you are designing a, a filament thing that can help absorb solar and in no distant time you provide her with solar stove so that she can still do that same cooking so she doesn't need to cut down the tree. She will love you. People just need to know that you have their back first. Feed them first. When you now do that, whatever you tell them afterwards, they will all remember. You can't take from them and expect them to still call you master. They will not do that. So, Jasmine, thank you so much. I'm so proud you have grown. Yeah, uh, you have a little fan here. My daughter is waving and saying, no, 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 no. You know, that she thumbs up for, for you know, sticking up and saying the truth. So I will allow, um, I will allow um, my daughter. Kendra, do you still want to say something? Okay, she says she wants to say something. Okay. Allow her to say something. Hi. <laughs> we are good, Kendu. How are you? Happy, happy International, happy Youth, International Day. Youth Day. Thank you. So, do you have anything to say to Auntie Jasmine? Do you like her story about how she she has gone this far? Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank what you I, so much, Kendu. To tell, what do you in, how do you intend to help your your friends that are your age in grade three? How do you intend to tell your classmates about how to go to the better place? Well, well I think I inspired a lot. So, in what do you want to inspire? Hmm. Everything. Thank you so much, Kendu, for that. Uh, you can mute your mic. Thank you so much, Kendu, for that. On that note, I want to thank everyone and hand over to John Bosco. Uh, thank you so much, John Bosco, for allowing Team 54 Project to partner with you. Uh, yes, uh, Pete, we will sign off with the peace light, but John Bosco, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel, and um, the Team 54 Project International Team. You've added a lot more colors to this uh, program because uh, like Jasmine said, you cannot just go to the SDG and say you're picking one of them. No, it doesn't work that way because for each one, it's directly and indirectly as well connected to the other one. But I, I would like to read the, uh, the United Nations message for this International Youth Day so that everyone can hear. And like we know, the theme is Youth Engagement for Global Action. So um, the statement reads in parts. It says, as the United Nations turns 75 and with only 10 years remaining to make the 2030 agenda a reality for all, trust in public institution is eroding. At the international level, against the backdrop of an increasingly polarized world. The international system of governance is currently undergoing a crisis of legitimacy and relevance. In particular, this crisis is rooted in the need to strengthen the capacity of the international system to act in concert and implement solutions to pressing challenges and threats. Examples include some of the worst contemporary conflicts and humanitarian emergencies, such as Syria, Myanmar, 
as well as global challenges such as the COVID-19 outbreak and climate change. Enabling the engagement of youth in formal political mechanisms does increase the fairness of political processes by reducing democratic deficits, contributes to better and more sustainable policies, and also has symbolic importance that can further contribute to restore trust in public institutions and especially among the youth. Moreover, the vast majority of challenges humanity currently faces, such as the COVID-19 outbreak and climate change, require concerted global action and a meaningful engagement and participation of young people to be addressed effectively. So the statement in part is also calling us to join the 31 days of you know, youth engagement and all of that. You know, they have this social media campaign to celebrate the young people throughout the month of August. So leading up and following International Day to help spread the word and strike up a conversation, you know, surrounding youth engagement for global action. So in the end, it said uh, this year's International Youth Day seeks to put the spotlight on youth engagement through the following three intercon interconnected streams. The first one is engagement at local and community level. The next one is engagement at national level. That's formulation of laws, policy, and their implementation by you know, the relevant authorities. And the last one, it says engagement at the global level. So this is, uh, I, I had to quote them, but the, the, my primary interest that I want to bring out is this last sentence. It talked about engagement at the local and community level first, which implies that uh, just like the popular saying, charity begins at home, we need to start from the local level. There is this mantra, um, Skyly Lott in the Miss Earth, New York. You know, she brought it up. She said, think global, but go local, which means we need to start from within us, from the family, our immediate community, from, from our religious affiliations, from everything before we start looking up to the bigger picture, because it is our individual picture that comes together to become a collected picture. So uh, on that note, I want to thank everyone once again for showing up, for supporting, for staying up to this long. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know the right words to use, but I want to thank everyone. And uh, if uh, Dr. Daniel still has something uh, to you know, bring in, uh, he will bring it now and then we can call it. Uh, I think we should just call it a minute because calling it a day seems too far for me. Because for me, we just call it a minute. I think we should call it a minute. A no, minute. I want to thank you, John. Exactly. Bosco. When we call it a minute, so... I, I want to thank you, John Bosco. And we wish everybody... We call and then we we'll quote the caption. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Daniel, do you have okay, something John Bosco, else? I wanted us to take a picture. John Bosco, I wanted us to take a screen grab of the picture. Let everybody put on their picture and okay, we take great. a screen grab. So we, can, we can use it... Uh, um, uh, for you know to show people that we had this interaction you know yeah. so if so, you don't want to yeah picture, Peter, just, I, Peter, I really like that i was go i was going to hang it but i ran out of time i was going to have it hanging okay. over there okay um I, I have taken the first picture uh though yeah um, our elder just came in with his picture. Okay, great, great. Um, I'm taking another one. So, um, bye bye, everyone. Francis is missing. So, I want to thank everyone once again, and uh, I, 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 I pray and believe that our efforts will not go in vain and as we are you know making effort to make this global village a better place than it used to be um i believe the youth will learn from us you know so that the next generation my prayer my hope my faith my belief all i am working for is so that the next generation will be better than us we, we have to set the platform 
we have to make the foundation solid yeah. so that this skyscraper we are hoping for, you know, we have a solid base to stand on. And on that note, I want to thank everyone once again and then wish all us well. Those who still have morning, good thank morning. You. Those who have afternoon, good afternoon. Yeah, and yeah, the boss, thank you yeah. contributions. It's good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm going to send you 19th century cosmetics. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Joseph here. Can I make one just 20 second comment? Y yes, you can. There are some people who are still on. Yeah. Okay, I think um, it, it, it's in reaction or response to what Gail had said about concentrating on the young people and forgetting about the older heads. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 79 years old and, uh, you know, I am one with the youth. Uh, the one gentleman spoke earlier and he said that youth need to sort of arm themselves. But the problem is within the context of the Bahamas in particular, the youth are to be seen and not heard. That general, general response. And so the only, the only uh, sort of elevation of the dignity of the young people uh, really is coming from NGOs like Gail's organization, uh, Re-Earth, uh, Save the Bays, Waterkeepers, and a couple of the other organizations that concentrate on human rights and children's rights. I'm involved with, with both human rights, uh, uh, children's rights, uh, women's rights, and all the rest. And so I want us to remember that, that it's not the fault of the young people because they are shot up very quickly if they have any particular opinion. And so I just want to make sure that that is understood, that we have to work more diligently with them in order to give them the power of the voice to be able to, to be heard by their individual countries. So I just, just wanted to add that. So thanks to everybody. Yeah, th thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that input. Thank you so much. And I believe we'll carry this message back to our organizations. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jeff. It's bye from me. Bye, here. Gail. Hey everyone. Love you all. Stay safe. Love you too. Love everyone. Thank you.